Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 33rd meeting of 2017. Apologies have been received from Liam MacArthur. And before we move to item agenda number one, we have um, some declarations of interest. Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yes, I'd just like to declare my interest as a solicitor with a current practicing certificate with the Law Society of England and Wales and with Scotland, uh, and also a landlord in the private rental sector in Edinburgh and a member of the Scottish Association of Landlords. Thank you. Okay, and Ben McPherson. Just a reminder to the committee that I am registered on the role of Scottish solicitors. Yeah. These aren't necessarily pertinent to item one, but they will be to later items in the agenda. Agenda item number one is consideration of the affirmative instrument on telecommunications restriction orders custodial institution Scotland regulations 2017. And I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Anne Davis who is Senior Principal Legal Officer, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government, and Jim O'Neill, Senior Legal Services Manager with the Scottish Prison Service. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and ask the Cabinet Secretary if he wants to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Uh, members may recall that the Scottish Parliament agreed by legislative consent motion in 2015 to amendments to the then UK Series Crime Bill to allow us to bring forward these regulations. The regulations build on the steps we have already taken to tackle illicit mobile phone use in prisons. Parliament has already agreed changes to prison rules, made changes to the law to create offences for introduction and possession of mobile phones or their component parts in prison without authorisation and made changes in the law to allow us to interfere with the wireless spectrum and pilot interference technology in two prisons to disrupt mobile phone use. I understand that members took the opportunity to understand more about the technology and its capabilities in private, and I am grateful to the members who participated in that. Uh, let me be clear, the unauthorised use of mobile phones in prison presents a range of serious risks to the security of prisons and to the safety of the public. They can be used to plan escape or in discipline or to conduct serious organised crime, including drug imports and serious violence from behind bars. These regulations will support our commitment to reducing the harm caused by serious organised crime as part of Scotland's serious organised crime strategy. The challenges posed by unauthorised mobile phones and their component parts into prisons and young offenders institutions is not insignificant. Component parts such as SIM cards are easily concealed. While we, while we uh, may have uh, been able to recover uh, a number with more than 1,500 mobile phones or component parts since 2013, more will escape detection. We remain committed, however, to minimising the number of mobile phones entering prisons, to find phones and, uh, for those who have got them, uh, to block phones, uh, to make sure that they are not able to access the network. With uh, these provisions, uh, the courts will be able to also set in place a process to remove particular phones from the network. This will render them worthless and stop prisoners using those phones to engage in criminal activity from prison permanently. This will help both the police and prison authorities to maintain the security of our prisons and the safety of our communities. These regulations will not prevent the introduction of illicit mobile phones or their component parts to prisons. However, the successful disabling of a mobile phone will put it beyond use and will seriously disrupt the activities of those individuals, including those involved in serious and organised crime, who would seek to extend their criminal activity threats or presence beyond the walls of our prisons. I know some members will be concerned about the potential impact of the regulations outside prisons. However, I trust that the opportunities provided by my officials to understand the evidence that will be obtained to satisfy a court that these mobile phones are in prison has provided the reassurances that they needed. The committee may also find it useful to know that the communications service providers have told us that they would welcome a clear legal instrument which establishes a route by which they would be able to com be compelled to, be act, to act on these matters. And these regulations will provide that clarity. And I'm happy to take any questions from members. Do members have any comments or questions? John Finney, Mary Fee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I 
I availed myself of that briefing last week and took no reassurance. In fact, simple questions that I asked the last time this was discussed, which I thought could have been uh, addressed, were not, and they remain the, the, the case that it's not addressed. Um, the particular SI, Regulation 3, and if I read from the explanatory note, which is a bit easier for the layperson, um, it says, this is to cater for the situation whereby a communication device is disconnected in error and it obviates the need for an individual or the applicant to apply to the sheriff for the order to be varied or discharged. In what circumstances would that become the case? If a phone had been blocked from the network and it then became, uh, it was brought to the prison services of, uh, attention uh, that it, uh, it was not a mobile phone which was within a prison establishment, then it could be it reconnected to the network. So the way in which the orders will operate is that when uh, a court issues the order for the uh, communication service provider to uh, block it, uh, that uh, there will be provision within the order to allow it to be reconnected if an error has been identified. However, experience to date would suggest that the likelihood of an error like that happening would be extremely rare, uh, but there is provision to allow it to be reconnected to the network. I'm neither a lawyer nor a telecommunications expert, and, but my... my job is to understand the legislation and provide reassurance where it's required. There's no consultation taking place in this uh, legislation. There's no equality, children's or privacy impact assessments. Why is that the case? Can I say that? Well, the particular reason around um, uh, not requiring any further um, assessment of that is because it relates to communication devices within the prison estate, uh, which is already illegal. Uh, plus, at the same time, in relation to uh, relating to uh, privacy impact assessment, um, this, is not, this doesn't allow access to communications between individuals. Uh, this is about uh, communication traffic. So it's about numbers of phones, etc., and SIM cards, etc. So it's, about, uh, it's not about the communications that take place between two individuals, which is a different process, which I'm sure the member uh, is aware of. Um, if I ask uh, and David, she can maybe set it a wee bit more fully, the process which will happen with the orders when they go before uh, the court and the provision which will be made within that, to allow any variation of that to be made subsequently should further information become available, if that would but, be helpful. But, but, well, perhaps, if I may, in advance of that, I mean, my concern is about a collateral intrusion uh, and the potential impact, if indeed there is any, to interfere with um, uh, particularly health apps. So, for instance, trial does a, a Crohn's disease health app that can help people remotely. A very quick search, just before I come up here, uh, um, um, a uh, press release from the NHS using mobile technology for safe and effective care of patients taking multiple medicines. Now, this is something that's done remotely and it's about polypharmacy issues. Um, I asked the official had there been discussions with um, NHS about poten potential impact. All I'm wanting is for someone to say there is no impact or there is an impact, but we, you know, we understand it and we'll take that into consideration. Because I absolutely want robust procedures to ensure that there isn't an abuse of mobile phones and, and that the law is enforced. But I don't want any suggestion of anyone being vulnerable. And I've given the example in the past of Inverness Prison where you know that dwelling houses are closer to the prison than you are to me at this particular moment. So can you provide any reassurance? Well, I can provide assurances and... It what experience we have today, and the experience we have today with the pilots that have been operating is that uh, no issues have been identified um, of the nature the member has raised. And some of these establishments have uh, residential properties very close by uh, to them. Uh, it, secondly, it's also worth uh, saying that the experience we have today has also been shared with uh, our counterparts in England and Wales who have also been using similar types of technology. And again, they haven't identified the same types of problems or concerns that the member um, has expressed. Um, what I can say is the Scottish Prison Service already engaged with the Scottish Centre for Telecare and Telehealth uh, on these issues uh, and will continue to engage with them going forward. Um, given the way in which this technology operates as well, it's worth keeping in mind, so for example, in telecare, um, the vast majority of telecare is provided through landline-based mm -hmm. systems. Um, although I suspect as time goes by, a greater amount of it will actually be provided through um, uh, mobile phone technology. The data that is collected um, as part of the process in identifying a phone being used within uh, the prison estate and the further measures that are then taken forward by the prison service, along with Police Scotland and also uh, with the uh, service provider, would allow them to identify 
um, a line which was being used for telecare or telehealth at that stage. Uh, so I'm confident that the process in there would allow these types of um, uh, use of a mobile network to be identified if it was being used in close proximity to uh, to a prison estate. It's also worth keeping in mind is that um, the way in which the prison service deploy this technology um, it can also ensure that it minimises the risk of it going beyond uh, the boundary of the prison walls itself. I don't want to go into the details of this too much because it's operationally sensitive um, and the way in which the data they gather as well and the way in which they then verify that data is obviously sensitive. But I'd like to provide a reassurance to remember that these matters have been thought through and what we will do is continue to engage with stakeholders such as the Scottish Centre for Telecare and Telehealth to make sure that the way in which the prison service are operating this technology is mindful of the needs of individuals who may live in close proximity to prisons who are making use of telecare and telehealth provisions. Thank you. That's very reassuring. It would have been more reassuring if we'd had it last week and it would have saved this, but um, thank you very much, indeed. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. I, I have a, a similar concern to that of uh, my colleague um, John Finney. Um, at, at the briefing um, last week, I raised the issue of emergency calls being made outside the prison grounds, and I was quite concerned to hear that these regulations, and whilst I have no issue at all with the need for these regulations, um, there is a potential for a call made immediately outside the perimeter of the prison to um, the emergency services, if there was a, a, a threat to life, a health problem, the call would be barred. And I, I really just want a similar reassurance that you've given to, to, to John Finney, that these are issues that you will continue to monitor and perhaps work with network providers and the emergency services to make sure that those calls, if barred, will be reconnected as quickly as possible. Well, uh... I, I can't guarantee they'll be reconnected quickly as possible because I'm not a, a communication no. service provider. But what I can assure you is that the process that the, what these regulations provide for is a process that allows the Scottish Prison Service to go and get a court order for, uh, for a mobile phone device to be blocked from the system, which renders it useless. Uh, so there's a number of steps in that particular process which they would go through. Uh, so it wouldn't happen immediately. Um, uh, at that particular point. Now, in terms of the technology, the interference technology, which is already used at, mm. uh, uh, at some of our prison establishments, we haven't experienced that type of issue uh, to date. Um, now, uh, there are ways in which, uh, would you call, uh, we can continue to monitor that, mm. and the prison service are taking a precautionary approach in trying to address these types of issues should they arise. Um, uh, but if, it, if an incident like that did arise and it came to the attention, then it would be a matter for the prison service to then look at are there other measures which we need to take forward in order to minimise that. And part of that is about uh, the nature of the deployment of the technology. Again, these are operationally mm -hmm. sensitive issues and I don't want to give too much detail around those because um, they could be useful to those who wish to circumvent them. But um, these are the technology in this area is continually developing as well. Uh, which will allow the prison service to continue to adapt its approach as technology develops and also making sure it's taken into account that it's not causing undue uh, at risk to individuals who live in close proximity to our prison estates. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Liam Kerr. Good morning. Um, I would be supportive of this measure, I, I, but I didn't have the benefit of attending this briefing the other week, so I'm just wondering if you can help me understand uh, just a bit more about it. Uh, am I right, then, that this doesn't require the actual finding of a unit? What it requires is the discovery of a signal, uh, and then the telecoms provider locking down that specific individual signal. And if I'm right on that, then who monitors for that, uh, and who has the onus of taking the, the, the steps to shut it down, to phone the telecoms provider, as it were, and say, there's the signal, lock it down. So the way in which it will operate is that the prison service will use the um, uh, interference technology, which allows them to identify whether well, there's a mobile phone being used within the prison estate. They will then, uh, uh, if they believe it could be in the, 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 the prison estate, they'll obviously um, uh, uh, capture that data. They will then... Um, uh, work in partnership with Police Scotland around some checks that they will then carry out uh, uh, around the data which the, the prison service have. They will then um, uh, uh, go to the uh, communication service provider 
um, who will obviously then carry out some further checks. And once that process is being completed, it then allows the prison service to bring that information together and then to put it to uh, a sheriff who will then determine uh, whether an order should be issued. Once the order has been issued, then the communication service provider has a responsibility, a legal responsibility, uh, to block uh, that particular uh, device, which renders it useless. Um, it can't be used. Uh, then. So there's, uh, there's a process in there uh, which has gone through. Um, uh, again, I don't want to go into the details around specifically the information in which they get and the different, the different elements that the agencies uh, take forward to identify a particular phone. Um, uh, but it's one which uh, I believe once the courts have received that data, they'll be in a position where they can make an informed decision about whether an order should be issued and then for the communication service provider to then take action. Now, I should say that there's also a memorandum of understanding uh, which has been agreed between uh, the Scottish Government, uh, Ofcom uh, and the communication service providers around how this type of technology will operate and how it will be implemented as well. Um, that's been in place since 2014 now, um, and we've continued to refresh that and develop that and going forward um, as this technology develops. So uh, uh, the uh, overall testing of how the prison service are utilising this technology is a matter which uh, Ofcom would be responsible for. Uh, and Ofcom would uh, need to be satisfied that the prison service are using it appropriately and with the appropriate safeguards in place as well. So uh, there's a number of different mechanisms around this process, but it's a, uh, it's a, a process that involves a number of different parties uh, before it gets to the court and then for the court to then consider the evidence that's presented to them uh, before issuing an order. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... We now move to um, consideration of the motion. Uh, agenda item two is the formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered the report and reported on the instrument has no comment to make. Uh, the motion will be moved and an opportunity for formal debate if necessary. The motion is 08386 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Telecommunications Restriction Orders Custodial Institution Scotland Regulations 2017 draft be approved. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make any closing comments and move the motion. No further comments. Thank you. The question is that motion 08386 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft report? Thank you for that. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending, and also Mr McNeil from the SPS. Um, can I say that I think the committee very much appreciated the, the briefing we got at Shots Prison, which was very full and very helpful, and also the briefing that the committee got last week in private. I suspend briefly now to allow the Cabinet Secretary and officials to leave. Uh, agenda item four is consideration of three negative instruments. I refer members to paper two, which is noted by the clerk. The first instrument is Housing Scotland Act 2014 Consequential Provisions, Order 2017, SSI <coughs> 2017, oblique 329. Do members have any comments? All right. Um, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Right, thank you for that. The second instrument is Rent Regulation Assured Tenancies Form Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 oblique 349. Do members have any comments? No comments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. The third instrument is Pensions Appeal Tribunal Scotland Amendment Rules 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 367. Do members have any comments? No comments. 
Um, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed, thank you. And I suspend briefly to draw the panel of witnesses for the Civil Litigation Bill to take their seats. Agenda item four is our fifth evidence session on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is private paper. And I welcome Martin Haggerty, Managing Director of Ac Accident Claims Scotland, Paul Brown, Chief Executive and Principal Solicitor of Legal Services Agency, John Simmon, Director Quantum Claims, Professor Alan Patterson, School of Law, University of Strathclyde, and Thomas Doherty, Parliamentary Affairs Manager, with which? That should be George Clark. Oh, yeah. I've misnamed you. It's George Clark from Director of Quantum Claims. Right. Nice to, to have you, Mr. Clark. And um, can I thank in particular Thomas Doherty for providing a written submission. We now move straight to the questions, starting with Fulton Mackay. McGregor. McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can, can, what you offer, can what you offer Mr. Clark? I've been on committee for a while now. Been on. <laughs> OK, go. Um, uh, thanks, convener. Um, I've been called Fulton Guy before. Um, I, and good, uh, good morning, uh, panel. Uh, just a very general question uh, to kick us off with. We've, we obviously know the objective of the bill is to increase access to justice. And I'm just... We, we have heard various... Uh, um, you know, evidence from, from various uh, people on that, that very issue. Um, but what, what are your uh, views on that? Do you think this bill will increase access to justice? And I suppose, uh, do you believe that there is an issue around access to justice in the first place? And I'm happy to take it in any order. Yes, <coughs> okay, I'll go for it. Um, very briefly, um, we vigorously support the introduction of class actions agreed proceedings. Um, indeed, it's been an idea floating around for my entire career. I can claim to have been involved with two forms of group proceedings. One, the now defunct procedure under the Public Health Scotland Act, 1897, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it is, which is a group pr procedure. Um, and also as, the, as one of hundreds of pursuers in a class action in New York. Both of these sets of proceedings were infinitely more straightforward and supportive than the equivalent individual actions. In the case of the Public Health Scotland Act, it was a bit to do with abatement of a nuisance. I think there were 18 pursuers. The only one writ, uh, the cost to the defender and the, compl the complexity undoubtedly were less than they would have been otherwise. The only complexity really was the 18 legal aid applications and some people falling off legal aid, but that one level was the my responsibility and not an access to justice issue as such. Um, and a remedy and abatement of a nuisance was obtained fairly speedily. So um, I was very impressed with that. It's now been abolished, but um, the opportunity for taking similar actions would seem to me to be a good idea. The other, the New York action was basically a small claim that would have been unpursuable without a class action. It was an opt-out class action. A get a letter saying you, you, you are in this claim whether you like it or not, or you can sign a document saying you can get out if you want. Obviously, no reason not to. But I was very impressed with that. It was far more straightforward than claiming most benefits. So I have no doubt that a, the introduction of a group procedure would increase access to justice. It is, it's really the main issues are legal aid and publicity, but those 
issues can be overcome. I think the ordinary person who reads national press or watches the news or whatever and hears about class actions elsewhere will come to Nan's understanding of it fairly speedily. And as I said, my experience is that it's hugely less stressful and more straightforward for the, the party, the, the pursuers involved. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bartis. Yes, <clears throat> I too have been a member of a class action in America. I think it was overcharging for gas services, and it applied to a whole area. Instead of the hundreds of thousands of people in the area each having to raise an individual action against the gas company, a collective action was raised. We didn't have to uh, opt in. It was, uh, it was an opt-out one. It was very straightforward. This is the way to deal with very uh, uh, small cases, or well, small level cases, or even medium level cases, where everybody has a common interest and there are thousands of people involved, defective washing machines, all sorts of things. It is not cost effective uh, to say that thousands of people have to raise the same action against a particular washing machine company or a gas company and so on. So, uh, as uh, Paul has indicated, the problems are how you fund these. We, we've known that class actions or group actions are a good thing for 30 years. We've had three reports in Scotland, all of them saying we should have these things. The problem has been how you fund them, and we will no doubt come back to that. Thomas Dockerty? I mean, we would obviously echo the principle of group proceedings being important, and, and I think the key, the key thing you're hearing, Convener, already is that opt-out is the, is the crucial bit rather than an opt-in mechanism, and as we shows in our, in our written submission to you, our concern is the bill as it currently stands, at the risk of having my glass half full, it is, it is better than nothing, but it, it, it won't deal with those specific cases that, Patterson, that, uh, that um, um, uh, Professor Patterson already touched on, where you have a relatively small amount to an individual, but the cumulative uh, damage to the, to the group is significant if you, if you don't have an opt-out mechanism rather than an opt-in mechanism. And any other comments? Mr. Clark? Yes, um, I, I'm here really to, to focus on just a, to, to air a couple of concerns, um, uh, namely on two short points in part one of the agreement under section four and part two under section 10. Um, just by way of background, uh, quantum claims uh, was formed in 1988 as one of the first uh, no win, no fee organisations in the UK. So we have a very mature uh, funding product that has evolved over time as, as the law has changed and, and evolved. And our pricing structure has been uh, evolved very carefully to match the, the requirement of the public, obviously, to meet uh, the, the public expectation and to market ourselves in the best way. Um, the, the bill is presently stated, it gives me um, two concerns about access to justice and a potential funding gap on individual case, not on group litigation, which I'll, I'll, I'll pass to, to those that uh, have looked at this in more detail, but on individual cases, which gives me a little bit of concern. And if I deal first of all with section four, uh, part one of the, the paper, section four, the power to cap success fee. And this comes obviously from uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor's report but he makes various recommendations about capping the, success, the, the degree of the success fee, and generally speaking, at around about 20%. But I should say that that is roughly in line with what Quantum Claims product is, and we gave evidence to Sheriff Principal Taylor, and perhaps he, he uh, um, derived that idea from, from our experience of it. However, I should put a word of warning into that, um, in that the law is evolving, it seems to me that he seeks to apply a cap across all categories of cases, and that is extremely dangerous in, in our, our experience, when particularly you're coming into areas such as medical negligence, breach of contract, professional negligence. These are uh, extraordinarily complex cases, long-running cases by definition, and uh, expensive cases to fund. And the capping of uh, the fee at a level which may not be sustainable uh, would discourage funding or, uh, organisations <coughs> from participating in, in the process and therefore denying access to justice to a certain category of pursuer, in my view. It's uh, bringing on to the part two in section 10, the third party funding of civil litigation. It's, it's really a, a similar point, I suppose. Um, 
The, the issue there is obviously about the ability or the proposal that uh, the um, introduction of one-way cost shifting, which is a good thing, I think is generally approved uh, there, <coughs> but with an exception for third-party funders to potentially be made liable for the expenses uh, in, in an action. Now, that is, is clearly um, a difficult position for companies such as ourselves in terms of providing funding if we are looking at a risk which we do not know before we enter into a funding arrangement um, and for the pursuer also whereby they could suddenly find themselves in a position whereby there's a funding aspect of it uh, that they weren't aware of when they start. So um, my concern about it is, and I'll give an example, um, shall we say, that of a category of case, um, let us say a, a case worth be covering that in more detail. It's just a rough kind of guidance of the areas of the bill at present where you have some concern. There will be an opportunity to come back with more detail as we um, go into that line of question about oh, the third party. I was just by means of covering it up very briefly to, to finish that. This is my final point really mm -hmm. about this is uh, just to, to say that in terms of that, um, whereby um, the funding of a small, let's say a case of five to 10,000 pounds category of case, um, whereby the funder is being exposed to the uh, uh, coverage of outlays, which average at about £2,000 minimum for even the smallest of cases, plus the exposure to civil expenses in the event of the case not, ex not one of, let's say, £30,000, £40,000, um, that would discourage the funding of any action. And, and there, there are a large category of, of, of parties who would be discouraged from pursuing an action whereby they have got to find two to three thousand pounds of funding. My only point is in, in terms of these have to be looked extremely carefully, in my opinion, in terms of defeating the point of the bill, which is to, to improve access to justice. That's, uh, that's my submission, if you like. Right, thank you. Anyone else, other comments, uh, Martin? Yeah, um, basically, just to, to echo what uh, Mr. Clark has said, I think uh, in general, um, the principle of a, of a cap uh, on damages or success fees is, is uh, fairly sound thinking, but it, it, I do think there has to be a distinct um, a reassessment of, of the amount of that, again, because of the, the, the type of cases involved and to reflect the complexity of the case. Um, but otherwise, I think anything that improves the access to justice for innocent victims has to be a good thing. Um, basically, I think, uh, Apart from that, Mr. Clark has, has covered the, the, the funding side of things in brief, and I understand that we will go on to talk about that in more detail. So. Okay. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, just, uh, you've talked quite a wee bit about what I was going to ask you, but I just want to um, ask um, the panel if they think that uh, damage-based agreements and qualified one-way cost shifting does um, improve access to justice for the, co the customer. Who would like to lead in that, Mr. Clark? Yes, I, I think so. Um, um, they, are, they, they are the way forward. Um, effectively, we have been operating that for 30 years. So, uh, to bring the rest of the law in line with that it has got to be a sensible thing and a, and a step forward in terms of access to justice, mm -hmm. with the qualifications I've put in place about uh, some of the detail. Mm -hmm. Professor Patterson. Uh, I should declare interest in the sense that I was on the reference group for uh, Shared <coughs> Principal Taylor. I agreed uh, that there was an argument for damages-based awards, but uh, very much agreed also with Shared Principal Taylor that it has to be subject to appropriate protections. So we may come on to the protections later. Okay. No other comments? Can, can I ask, um, just hypothetically, is it possible for two fees to be paid? Uh, under a success fee agreement, one to the claims management company and one to the solicitor. Does this system allow for that, or is that a, a loophole that, that exists there? Uh, are you uh, talking specifically about success fees? Yes. Um, well, from my experience uh, and from my own company's point of view, no, because uh, if we were to charge a success fee, um, we, we operate that only in the instance of uh, cases which settle without the need for court proceedings. Thereafter, we have a mechanism <coughs> whereby the solicitor can take over the, the uh, litigation aspect of it. And uh, in a recognition of the additional work that they will have to put in, they would then 
uh, take the success fee rather than ourselves. I see. Right. Thank you. That's that's clarified. Anyone else want to comment? Okay. Um, can I just ask you generally, are there any other measures um, which you'd like to see in the bill um, which would enable, uh, which would improve uh, the ability for access to justice? Anything you feel has been missed? Yes. I think uh, you've, you've seen a, a written submission, not from me, but concerning environmental law, and I, I would have thought the proposal that the restriction on pursuers' liability for expenses should be expanded to include environmental issues. That does sound a uh, reform that would improve access to justice, even in cases where there's not much likelihood of a pursuer paying a defender's expenses. It's a big disincentive to, to litigation. Um, so I would uh, support the proposal that it be, that the, the disqualification be applied to environmental issues as well. Of, of that. Uh, I, I suppose the, the example I could give is the almost complete absence of people taking up these issues. I mean, we've seen a large amount of publicity about <laughs> air quality and so forth. Some circumstances, air quality would be a nuisance, but it doesn't seem to happen. So there is a, um, a, a the, the, the traditional controls over litigation that derive from other ages um, do provide a barrier, and I think there is a need for removal of them simply to do with the rule of law, and it's not just access to justice generally. The Unison case made it clear that, you, that access to justice is a way of ensuring that Parliament's decisions are applied, and I think that needs to be taken very seriously, as I know the committee does. Thomas Doherty. I think as the, uh, uh, a committee has been in discussions with the Scottish Government on claim management companies need to be regulated. That, I suspect that's partly why some of the panel are here today. So we think that that is absolutely crucial, particularly with the financial guidance bill that's currently, I think, just about have its third reading in the House of Lords, so it's at the halfway point. I think it would be odd if there was a gap in regulation between Scotland and England and Wales. Anyone else have a view on that? That's simply my experience. I, I do a fair amount of criminal injuries compensation claims and sometimes people find up and say, well, we've got somebody else dealing with it and it's purely telephone-based advice based on a percentage fee. Mm -hmm. um, and I would share the concern that people don't understand what they're getting involved with hard sell, not necessarily remotely in the best interests of the applicant, and also to some, sometimes defeating the objective of the whole arrangement, which is that people get compensation if they're paying 20% of it or whatever to somebody else for very little work. That doesn't seem to me to be achieving the objective that the whole arrangement's been set up to achieve. That whole line of questioning, yes, where we can go into more, de to. more depth. Fine, uh -huh. And um, a supplementary, Liam Kerr? Uh, so we're absolutely clear, Mr. Haggerty, if you would uh, just, Rona Mackay was talking about fees, uh, and I think you were saying where a matter escalates to a solicitor, uh, then the solicitor takes the success fee, or that's there. Yeah. Your firm will need to get paid. So do you get a, 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 a referral fee from the solicitor? Um, yes, in principle it is a referral fee, um, but I would quantify that by saying that we do uh, a substantial amount of work in preparing the, the case, taking background information. We're also, uh, unlike many claims management firms um, down south in particular, um, we engage with the client um, and we do offer other services to the client, such as replacement vehicles after a car accident, assistance with uh, finding vehicle repairers. Um, and we also, after the case is uh, underway, are involved in, in such aspects as taking statements from witnesses, preparing locus reports. So we do provide a value for any service, as distinct from, from uh, my colleague here, who, who has said that in many instances, some claims management companies are purely a telephone-based marketing device. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yes, we, we, we do receive uh, some payment from the solicitors, right. um, partly for uh, finding the case and partly for the work that we do. Uh, and the, the question begged then is, if your firm gets a fee 
uh, from the solicitor. Uh, Mr Brown talks about acting in the best interests of the client. Who is your firm's client? Isn't it the solicitor's firm? Um, not necessarily, because we do not act purely for one solicitor's firm or, or deal with one solicitor's firm. We, we, we deal with, with other firms. And it depends on the type of case. So, for, for example, for a road traffic accident, we, we may deal with one or two firms. We may have another firm who specialise in, in industrial disease or accidents at work or medical negligence. Um, but we are acting for the client in the first instance, and we are um, offering uh, to find that client as a range of services, including expert legal advice from someone who, who specialises in that area of law. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bartikson. Yes, yeah, so if I could pick up that, that last issue, it's not directly to claims management companies, but there are instances of claims companies who are uh, encouraging PPI claims. And issues have arisen as to when a solicitor gets involved, who is the solicitor acting for? Is it for the um, claims company? Is it for the claims company and the client? Or, so. And it makes a big difference <clears throat> because it affects fiduciary duty, it affects remedies if the lawyer is acting for the client or only for the claims company. So it is very important that in these kinds of contracts, and that would extend to claims management companies, that there is um, clear explanation. There's a, a duty on solicitors not just to act in the best interest of the client, but there's also an ethical duty to communicate effectively and get their informed consent to certain contracts. That means you have to tell them everything material that relates to the case that you are aware of as a solicitor. All of these things have to be carried through, and I'm sure they are carried through by quantum claims, but we're talking about all kinds of other claims management companies coming through, and these issues have to be addressed. Now, I, I should say that the Law Society is aware of this, and there is a working party being set up to look at some of the ethical issues that might arise but we have to be aware of these issues. Okay, uh, John Finney. Yeah, uh, good morning, panel. Uh, panel, the, the um, provisions of the bill will enable solicitors to enter into damage-based agreements. You, can you outline what you see as the pros and cons of that form of payment? And in addition, do you feel that there's a, a need for additional protections for consumers or for the perception of a conflict of interest for solicitors? Well, if I could just what I just said, yes. Uh, there is. Um, if you enter into a contract with your client <coughs> lawyer, normally, uh, you, have the, you have to, the contract has to be fair and reasonable. Secondly, it has to have informed consent. Thirdly, it must be something an independent uh, person would advise. And as a matter of ethics, in addition to those duties which are fiduciary duties, uh, you're required to be independently advised. Now, that's impractical when it comes to the contract of retainer between lawyers and clients. I'm talking about the general contracts of borrowing and lending between a lawyer and a solicitor or getting gifts or uh, wills and all sorts of things. But when you get into unusual retainers, supposing your, uh, your, your fee was an equity fee or your fee was a publicity fee, um, uh, now... If you get into an unusual uh, fee, and some of the claims management fees or some of the, um, uh, the uh, speculative action uh, fee contracts we have could be viewed as quite unusual. And in those circumstances, I think the need for informed consent and proper communication is there. And I would argue there may be a case in some of these cases for independent advice. For example, I, I know Share Principal Taylor is of the view that 2.5% of future loss uh, is not in the grand schemes a problem. But in some cases it might be a problem and people need to be advised about that. And that's why 6.6 has the need for an independent um, uh, advice uh, uh, <coughs> from an actuary. <coughs> in certain cases I think there may be a need for independent advice uh, from a, an independent lawyer. Not in all cases, but in some cases. Other panel members care to comment on that? Yep. I would only uh, uh, say on the, the regulation point, from, I, I can't really comment on the solicitor's um, duties uh, to advise their clients. Um, 
the regulation point, I welcome it. I think it is absolutely essential. The, um, uh, I uh, believe that there are what you might call cowboy organisations out there that would take advantage of situations. Um, and I think it has been prevalent. I think it's less prevalent now, but it is still exists. Uh, and I, for one, would welcome it. Um, we have never engaged in telephone marketing sales or anything like that. We've advertised um, traditionally. We have written contracts where clients have cooling off periods and advice available to them. And that's, uh, I would uh, endorse what Professor Patterson has said. That is entirely right. And I think it should be brought into the realm for every contract entered into by clients. Uh, and uh, frankly, I would welcome it. Thank you. Can, can I maybe just clarify with Professor Patterson? You would see that independence as a protection not only for the client, but also for the solicitor? Oh, yes. It, underneath it all is the potential for conflict, and it protects both. Mm -hmm. But I'm not suggesting you necessarily need it for every <coughs> speculative fee and every uh, uh, damage-based award, but in some, I think there may be an argument for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, in principle, I would, I would agree. Um, from my own perspective, my company, as I say, uh, at the stage of any litigation, hands over the, the, the control of the case to the solicitor and any success fee thereafter. So thereby there is an impartiality um, we remove, remove from the process. Um, I would also point out we don't engage as a company in any activity other than accident claims. We don't get involved in the, the less reputable, in my opinion, side of the business, such as PPI or holiday sickness claims and things like that. Uh, up until recently, I would have said that in Scotland we don't necessarily need regulation because there are very few claims management companies here, but the problem to me really stems from the amount of uh, English-based companies who are advertising nationwide and, and are preferring advice to, to people here without any uh, regard for the, uh, the, the, the laws of Scotland or the, the, the system of damages that we have, uh, and perhaps just selling that case on to the highest bidder. In some cases, that's even been English-based solicitors' firms who ostensibly then take the thing forward um, and try and resolve it without the need for litigation. So um, I think more recently, with, with the increase that we're seeing in that, then I, I would welcome some form of regulation here. Thank you very much, Dean. Okay. Moving on to May. Thank you. Um, it was really just in terms of some of the evidence that we heard in previous sessions, particularly from defender representatives. They'd raised concern that they believe that the bill is currently drafted would lead to a compensation culture in Scotland and that we would need to put additional measures in place such as fixed fees and strengthened pre-action protocols uh, to try and mitigate against that. And it was really just to get your thoughts on that and do you believe that it would give rise to a compensation culture in Scotland? Um, I, over the years, um, I've been involved in, in claims since 1979. Um, and Accident Claims Scotland was formed in 2003. And over the, over the years, we've done quite a lot of research into uh, the, the behaviour of claimants and potential claimants. Uh, and I don't really see that uh, over the last 10, 15 years or so that there has been particularly a rise in a compensation culture in Scotland. I think we've always been um, fairly uh, conservative with a small C, if I may say that. Um, and roughly... You know, it's always been roughly sort of one in three has, has sought compensation for, for minor injuries. Uh, and most claims are for minor injuries. Um, I, I haven't seen a particularly large uptake, despite all the, the, the rise in advertising and press and on TV and on radio for, for accident claims uh, companies or lawyers. Um, and I don't see that, that, that uh, this will fuel any sudden rise in, in demand for compensation claims to be made. I think all it really is is offering uh, a fair means to, to members of the public to seek uh, recompense that they are legally entitled to. Um, as I say, the majority of people entitled to make a claim for personal injury don't do so um, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and these reasons are varied in, in my experience. Um, and 
again, they are mostly minor injuries. I don't think we're going to have a, a, a huge uh, rush in, in, in uh, the whiplash culture that has been experienced in, in uh, particular parts of, the, of the, the south of Great Britain. Okay, would anybody else like to comment on that? Uh, yes. Um, there's a lot of uh, press publicity about compensation cultures. Um, the research evidence doesn't bear it out in England and Wales, apart from the pockets of whiplash to which you referred. Um, there was a beautiful article produced by an academic which showed that there was a direct correlation between the number of claims going down and, and the number of media stories about compensation going up. But um, uh, in Scotland, the evidence is that litigation rates, civil litigation rates, have been gradually falling over the last five, six years. Now, I know there was a spike in personal injury, um, but I don't think there is evidence that, uh, um, that there's uh, a huge uh, uh, interest in, in raising personal injury claims. I'd be quite interested in the wards because when I was doing the original Path to Justice research with Hazel Gen, which was the start of the needs assessment literature that's gone around the world, we found large areas of people who were either doing nothing when faced with a significant uh, possible uh, claim uh, or, or, or helping themselves and, you know, just trying to help themselves and failing. Um, and we often think, well, personal injury, that's one where people know to go to a solicitor or a claims management company. Admittedly, this was 15 years ago, but what we found was personal injury uh, claims or possible claims, one of the highest, higher ones where people did nothing. So uh, there is room uh, for uh, the claims management companies to help us uh, to, to tackle things, provided uh, we have appropriate safeguards and we monitor what's, what's happening. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we are likely to see a compensation culture take off in Scotland. My experience is that in some areas there's been a big decline. Um, people hear publicity about cutbacks and legal aid that don't apply to Scotland and think that's the end of legal aid for them. Or they hear about cutbacks, say for criminal injuries compensation, and think that that doesn't apply, but don't realise that actually their injury hasn't been abolished, or they hear that wage loss has been removed, even though it's in, in criminal injuries compensation claims, even though it still exists in some situations, or they hear about time limits and don't realise that time limits in some situations are of guidance, but they're not absolute, they can be argued around. So all sorts of impediments. So I, I would have said there was a need for greater publicity. Some sorts of publicity do result in overshoot, but there are some areas like Equality Act claims and the whole rafts of employment-related matters which are barely pursued at all. So I don't see compensation culture being a problem. Mind you, I suppose one needs to look at the form of words used. Compensation in our world is a way of achieving accountability. So appropriate compensation needs to be encouraged. Um, lying, exaggerating, needs to be discouraged. If that's what the problem is, that needs to be discouraged rather than just saying people claiming lying, exaggerating, fraudulent claims. Well, the, 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 we, we, the bill has sanctions built into it for those, and people need to know about those as well. Um, just directly on the back of that, I mean, do you think that you say that the bill uh, tries to tackle some of that? Do you think that will be effective enough in preventing some of those, fra uh, those the fraudulent claims? Um, because. In terms of spurious claims as well, that was something that we've heard uh, evidence on as well from the representatives of pursuers and from Sheriff Principal Taylor, who seemed to think that there wouldn't be, there wouldn't necessarily be a rise in, in spurious claims because it's not within a solicitor's interest to to take up a claim that may not necessarily go anywhere or doesn't have uh, anything behind it. So it was really just to get your views on that as well. Do you think there would be a rise in spurious claim, as claims as a result of this? Well, in my experience is solicitors need to be very clear about appropriately, clearly analysing cases and telling people when they don't have a claim. Some, I suppose sometimes people have difficulty doing that. That's just because they want to help people. So that's a professional issue, but it is a real one because misleading somebody by, into being over-optimistic is just as bad as um, t 
telling somebody they don't have a claim when they do. So th I th think that's a professional issue. That in one level, one level, that's to do with making sure publicity is clear, so people really understand what it is that you're getting public sort of compensation for. So people need to just know the basics of the law, and they need to keep on being told it because it's not something that people necessarily that fascinated by. I suppose the other thing about it is to encourage the right sort of soaps on telly that explain these things because people do do pick up a lot through that route. Um, as I said, I don't see there being a major problem to do with it. It's not one that I've come across. Yeah. Uh, I would add that as um, the claims management, a representative of the claims management side of things, um, again, we haven't really seen a, a, a great increase over the last few years in, in spurious claims either. But we do, uh, and I'm sure Mr. Clark will concur, that we do as a responsible company uh, actual, actually uh, discover and weed out some of the less desirable or more spurious uh, cases. Um, and therefore, we actually prevent some of those cases getting as far as the solicitor. Um, it's not in our interests either in, in having spurious claims because if we were to present one uh, which did find its way to a solicitor and therefore <clears throat> potentially to litigation, um, any a work that we have done or any a referral fee that we charge to the solicitor is clawed back in the event that the case turns out to be uh, in some way fraudulent or the client seems to be misrepresenting the situation unreasonably. Um, so there is a, an onus on us to uh, ensure that uh, we perform our part uh, and weed out any undesirable uh, claims. Okay. Got Professor Pasterson, then Thomas Doherty. Yeah, <clears throat> just uh, just to add, I mean, the, the bill does can, contain certain protections so that if a legal ex, a legal representative raises a spurious claim and a spurious action, then they may be found personally liable in expenses. Now, I happen to think that that's the law anyway, but I'm glad to see it reinforced in statute now so uh, nobody can say, you know, I don't agree with that bit of the case law. No, it's, it's, it's clear there. And qualified one, uh, cost shifting, uh, you lose the benefit of that if you prove to be uh, fraudulent. Similarly, the same, and it's, it's the same way with legal aid. Uh, one of the protections of legal aid is that you can get your li if you lose, you, you can get your liability to pay the other side's expenses modified uh, to nothing. But that only applies <coughs> if the court takes the view that you've beha behaved reasonably, and the bill requires that as well. So there are the protections against these uh, potential spurious claims. Are you, Thomas Doherty? I mean, I think. Perhaps it goes back to the question that Mr McGregor asked at the start about access to justice. Um, we don't see claims management companies, we see claims management companies as a symptom of a, as a, of, a, of a problem we have in that too often companies, institutions won't pay back to consumers the money that they owed. And, you know, as, as a simple statistic, it, the National Audit Office estimates that between 2011 and 2015, claim management companies received, I think it was four to five billion pounds in management fees uh, for, for, you know, from, for, for, for PPI claims. And that's because those financial institutions in the very first place simply weren't coming forward who, because obviously they knew who their customers were, and saying, "Look, you know, we owe you money. We've got this wrong." Um, and we have we have a very simple case at which that we've been using a lot, which was we run a free service um, on our website <coughs> for for uh, PPI claims, which we've now engaged with a lot of the institutions. And we had one which member who got fifteen thousand pounds by just going onto that website and. Uh, putting in you know, his, his details, and I, I obviously won't say which financial institution it was. Now, the best, you know, that cut out the CMCs, and that's a great result. But there's an argument that says if it wasn't for those CMCs in the first place, you know, chipping away and, 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 and raising this issue, that those financial institutions wouldn't be in a situation where they have paid out, I guess, 18 to 20 billion pounds over the last, last few years. So hopefully that answers your point. Thank you, and I very much look forward to the civil litigation dramatisation. Thank you. <laughs>
Can I ask uh, about the issue of ambulance chasers? Um, obviously, you, you're talking about legitimate claims from consumers that perhaps haven't been followed, but there's another side of the coin. And while the, the two representatives, three representatives from the, the claims um, companies um, have explained how they would uh, behave with absolute propriety, is that still an issue? Um, I, again, and I, I, I would go back to uh, Martin's uh, uh, point he made earlier about this. I, th there is still an issue in England, I think, and, and there is a telemarketing culture. I think we've all had it. Um, um, anonymous phone calls, texts, etc. Have you had an accident in the last three years? Um, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is still an issue. Uh, it's a countrywide issue, not, not just a Scottish issue. And I, I genuinely agree that I don't think it is prevalent in Scotland. It, it comes from afar and it's generated from afar. I'm not aware of anyone in, in our industry, if you like, that, that, that uh, actively practices that in Scotland. I wouldn't, I'm not aware of it, but certainly I don't. But um, I think it is an issue and it does need to be looked at. Um, as I say, there, there, is a, there is a danger in that field still, in my opinion. If I could add, uh, I would agree um, that, uh, that there it is something that's very much driven from afar. And in, in what I do day to day, I'm constantly bombarded by data marketing companies um, from other parts of, uh, of the world, not just the United Kingdom, um, offering data for people who have had accidents or have, have had um, PPI in the past or whatever it may be, and saying we only deal with accident claims, but I, I do not, um, nor do the colleagues, my colleagues that I know of in this industry, engage in buying data. I think it's a very, um, it's a very uh, shoddy way to do business, but uh, I think something should be done that, that does actually protect the public from these uh, mass data gathering exercises and the, the constant exchange of details. And in many cases, the data I am being offered is said, whether it's genuine or not, is said to originate from insurance companies, the very people who cry wolf at the, the first sign of a, of a potential personal injury claim. Um, so, you know, you, these are, however they're getting the data, um, there is no doubt that there are some practices uh, involved that are uh, less than savoury. Okay, Thomas Trockerty. Would completely disagree that Scotland hasn't got a problem. Scotland has more of a problem with nuisance calls than any other part of the United Kingdom. We've done the research. There was a debate here in the Scottish Parliament in September, which I know some members took part in. You know, 80% 80, 80 of Scots have reported receiving nuisance calls on their landlines in the last in, in, in the month of August alone, according to our studies. 44%, as we put in our evidence, you know, almost half of those people are getting accident calls and PPI calls. It is not true that Scotland, Scotland has more of a problem than anywhere else. And one other statistic, convener, um, in the last year, 16 claim management companies based in, Scot based in Scotland have registered the company's house. This problem isn't getting smaller, it's getting bigger. If I could just add uh, <clears throat> to that, that uh, as I say, they, I don't deny that the, the members of the public are receiving unsolicited communications, whether by text or by telephone, whether it's PPI, personal injury or whatever. Um, it's just that uh, the majority of these uh, calls or texts originate from out with Scotland, the vast majority of them in my experience. And the, the opportunities to buy that data or to, to, to acquire these potential customers or clients um, generally does not originate in Scotland. Um, albeit that, yes, that there may well have been uh, several claims companies have registered at Companies House um, and uh, I do understand that there, there may well be many PPI based companies of that nature but certainly I haven't seen any great increase from the personal injury side of the business in Scotland um, but yes, that, so to take your point, I, I think we are plagued by them but I don't think that uh, it's, it's a big problem with the data originating here. I think it's, it's national companies um, marketing to the country as a whole and trying to pass the clients on to us up here in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. 
There's certainly some very useful information in Mr. Doherty's written <coughs> submission about even the Glasgow area and the number of, of calls there. It may be covered later. Uh, Morris, do you Thank want you, to answer? Could I ask a general question to the panel? Um, there is a sort of feeling of reticence of people who genuinely have a claim and they believe they have a claim but are put off by the fact that they might incur a record on the industry's um, notepad if they come to ask, for example, for insurance of a cover for a house. There is a general trend to feel that. Can you comment on that? And therefore, it's a black mark against them. Yeah, I think that's very much the case, certainly in, in motor accidents, uh, of which the majority uh, of, of uh, personal injury claims will emanate from. Um, I think very much uh, people think that if they make a, a claim, whether it be for their vehicle or whether it be for their person, um, that somehow this will affect their insurance premium. And then very often it does. Um, and uh, as a result of that, people very often seek the assistance of a, a claims management company or they just decide it's more bother than it's worth and they swallow their policy excess for the damage to their car and they get on with their daily lives. Um, and it's unfortunate that uh, we've tried in, in the past to kind of educate, through our advertising, educate the, the, the genuine members of the public who suffer an, uh, an injury through no fault of their own, that they do have rights and that there is something they can do. But I think there is very much a perception that in some way they'll end up on a database somewhere mm -hmm. and it's going to end up costing them more, more money. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that uh, if, if, it, if insurance companies themselves acted honourably, then the claims management industry from a personal injury or from a vehicle damage perspective wouldn't exist. And I say that as someone who, who, who originally came from an insurance company background. Um, and has seen this rise from, from nowhere, um, where people used to be left without any uh, assistance. I think also um, another observation that's useful, even now, in, uh, as we approach 2018, there's a great many members of the public who are in some way reticent about approaching solicitors directly about a claim because they think it's going to cost them money. And that, uh, that is the very off-putting, whereas they will come to a, a claims management company or an accident management company who are advertising no win, no fee, because they realise, A, that the, th that the process is not going to cost them uh, money if the case is unsuccessful, um, and B, at the end of the day, we are in some way more approachable than uh, solicitors. And, and I think there's still a perception that in, in, in many areas of, of the law that solicitors are somehow um, slightly otherworldly or, or intimidating in some way. And that's, that's not the case, obviously. But, but to, to many uh, ordinary members of the public, there's still, there's still a bit of reticence about that. Um, I still have clients who, who uh, when they go to, to see a solicitor, put a shirt and tie on, and it's possibly the only time other than weddings and funerals that they do so. So, um, but I think that, that over the years has been some, a feature of, of clients that uh, they're, they're worried about the process and they're, they're reticent to deal directly with the solicitor mm -hmm. um, for those variety of reasons. Mr. Mr. Brown. Oh, sorry. Mr. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. that, I, I absolutely agree. Um, that is why there is a need for law centres and indeed trade unions that help that bridge, I think, solicitors could do a lot as well in that you continually hear stories and I know some of them are accurate about people being told or oh, you want to see a solicitor well that's 250 pounds an hour and you have to pay in advance that sort of thing there is a real need for um, better interface between the legal profession and people in need um, I, it has improved in some areas and some people make a really big effort but nonetheless that's pushed back by as I said, in some areas of work, I've been in, in a solicitor's waiting room when a client was asked to put his card in 
to pay £250 before he saw his solicitor just for one hour interview about a complex employment law matter. I'm sure it was very good advice, but the point is that these sorts of costs are completely un impossible for 95% of the population. And if they think that that is the sort of level of costs, they obviously make a sensible calculation and realise it's un irrecover irrecoverable, even though there are ways around these sorts of things. So I, I, I share the concern about that. Mr. Clark. I have nothing for nothing that. I think it was all covered. Okay. We'll move on just to, to develop yeah. this a little bit. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, just briefly before I go into my substantive question, uh, both the question there and the answers asserted various things about perceptions uh, and reticence. And uh, I think, Mr. Brown, you said 95% of, of, of the population find something impossible. Uh, is there a danger, or I feel there's a danger, we draw universal conclusions from anecdotal evidence? Is there any objective evidence? Uh, for any of the points that either of you have just made? You mean statistical surveys? I'm sure there are. I think that's probably Alan's field rather than mine, but I would say that we have considerable experience about people being hesitant. I take your point, it's an anecdotal, but um, Pathways to Justice did review those fields, which um, Alan probably can remember more about it than I. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Uh, Path to Justice was a very large-scale national random sample uh, of people's experience of what we call justiciable problems. Um, where, uh, and we asked them, have you had uh, uh, one of these? We gave them a list of 65 possible problems, none of which mentioned the, the word law. And we said, have you had a problem like you know, sick pay, holiday pay, um, uh, falling downstairs uh, because of some accident or driving accident, and we asked them what they did with it, and who they turned to, if anybody, why they did this rather than that, and of course, um, we, we got evidence which you would not be surprised at about people being put off by the fear of costs. It's not necessarily a realistic fear of costs, sometimes it is a realistic fear of costs, but the, um, litigation is very expensive for an ordinary person. Um, most lawyers would not advise people to embark on litigation uh, individuals uh, because it is um, not always predictable what the outcome will be and it can be very expensive. So people are right to have a fear about that. Um, and uh, we've got research around the world. The past justice research has been followed in 26 countries with 35 studies uh, around the world, all producing very similar uh, forms of uh, result. In England, there's been more uh, past, uh, developments in past justice, uh, showing where justiciable problems are uh, uh, distributed. Um, we've done a little more in Scotland, and, uh, and, and the, the, the Crime and Justice Survey gives us some evidence as well. Um, we've no reason to believe that people are not put off by a, a fear of costs, and they should be. We are regularly asked <coughs> um, about whether or not we have done research on um, the legal experience for consumers in Scotland. Um, it's a conversation that I've had with uh, the Esther Robertson um, review. Um, and we, I think it's fair to say we would very strongly suggest that as part of Esther Robertson's review that research should be commissioned to look at the consumer experience. And it frankly appears to me to be a bit odd that the starting point of that review has not been to actually do a proper piece of thorough research. And it might be something that the committee may take up in the future with Esther Robertson. Hey, thank you. Uh, moving on, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of regulation, uh, and I appreciate time's short, so I'm going to fire questions, and if you wouldn't mind keeping the answers brief, I'd appreciate it. Um, do the claims management companies who are on the panel today have to meet any regulatory standards? Uh, and if so, who's the regulating body? Obviously in England and Wales there has been uh, claims management regulation for some time um, and my own company registered with that even though we didn't necessarily uh, have to. We did, we did find the odd English case and we thought we would, we would potentially stay um, well inside the, the, the areas of law that that uh, touched on, even though the volumes weren't sufficient to meet the, 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 the requirements. But uh, I figured that at the time that it was a morally uh, the right thing to do and that it gave the client some uh, assurance of the, uh, 
um, the professionalism and the integrity of the company that they were dealing with. But uh, other than that, no, there's no, no regulation of claims management activities in Scotland at present. Right. Anyone else want to add anything before I move on? Okay. Uh, so, Sheriff Principal Taylor I, last week said that most claims management companies were, quote, a fiction uh, because they were actually subsidiaries of law firms. Uh, is that your view? Are most claims management companies in Scotland subsidiaries of law firms uh, or, or do they often stand alone? If, if you take it in numerical terms, I don't think that's the case. If you took it in, in, in terms of the numbers of claims actually being processed, it may well be the case. There are, there are a couple of higher profile um, law firms who have their own claims management activities um, mm -hmm. rather than being independent of the process effectively. Um, but I, I may be wrong on that, but uh, I, that's my understanding of it. That, uh, I mean, that's not our view, and I, and, and, and I know it's not the view of the ABI either. We think Sheriff Principal Taylor misspoke last week. And I, as I said before, 16 CMCs have registered with Companies House in the last year alone. But I think in some ways, forgive me, but the, 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 the key thing is that regardless of, of whether or not you are attached to a law firm, the regulation should apply in exactly the same uh, way um, and again, that's why we strongly support the correspondence that you've been having as a committee with the Scottish Government that the Financial Guidance Regulation Bill should be extended um, to Scotland so that we have not just the same rules for those on law firms and those not, but the same rules operating in England, Scotland and Wales. And that would, frankly, go well a huge way to solving this problem. Yes, I want to explore that. The, okay. um, I, those 16, so I think what you're, what you're telling me is that uh, in the last year, yeah. 16 claims management companies have set up at Companies House, but they do not require to, to be regulated in any way. That's correct. Um, so does the panel, so I think Mr Doherty, if I'm reflecting you right, you would say that claims management companies should be regulated Absolutely. in Scotland. Absolutely, yeah. Does the panel agree with that view? Yes. Yeah. So the panel uniformly nods <laughs> for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Certainly so, 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 so <laughs> Principal Taylor. Yeah. Uh, well, Sheriff Principal Taylor also talked about referral fees only being able to be charged by regulated bodies. Uh, so I'll, I'll put this to Mr Haggerty, just because we spoke about referral fees earlier. You presumably agree with that, that referral fees should only be charged by regulated bodies, and therefore you should be a regulated body. Yes, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. So will you become a regulated body? Yes, absolutely. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, if that's if that's the decision that's made that the, the claims management activities should be regulated in Scotland, we would we were up there at the front of the queue. Yeah. But if that decision is not made, well, the, well, who would we register the, with then? If, if there's if there's no regulation, then the, the, then there is nothing to to sign up to. And that would be my final question, actually, which I might put to Mr. Doherty, but obviously sure. feel free to come come in. Uh, the who. If I engage a claims management company and something goes wrong in, in whatever way, to whom do I have recourse uh, for my complaints at the moment? Uh, where can I go? I mean, I'm the one who's not a lawyer on this panel, so um, I'm actually going to defer to the, to, the, to the lawyers on this. What I would say is that um, from our per perspective, we, we recognise that we are unregulated, but we were formed by a solicitor and our firm has been formed effectively as, uh, uh, on the same basis as all law firms are, with the same accounting process, professional indemnity requirements, etc. We, we, we mirrored it. Um, and in fact, the only time, I think in 30 years, we've had two complaints um, that went to the Law Society and the, by agreement with the Law Society, we agreed to allow them to adjudicate it. Mm. Uh, and we did, and I should say we were found to be not guilty of, of anything accused, but uh, we'll let the Law Society regulate us, mm. and, and, and they have a regulatory body that, that, that resolves conflicts or disputes. Um, I, I know that um, from giving evidence to, to Sheriff Principal Taylor, he didn't think that was a, a suitable way forward, but I would say why not? It's, it's, it's legal services by another name, so why not let the Law Society regulate claims management activity? Can I just clarify that? I, I, I personally know quantum claims pretty well from my previous career. Um, and so, so I know that quantum claims runs itself uh, 
reputably uh, and, and well, but uh, presumably there are these 16 other firms which we don't know, no. but uh, if I have a problem with them, I have no recourse. Uh, so your suggestion, Mr Clark, is that uh, the Law Society should be named as a regulatory body for claims management companies. I see no reason why not. Um, we should, uh, we should uh, I think claims management companies should adopt the same professional standards that, that, that solicitors do. I, I'm not afraid of that, and I think we should do. Um, so why not? And there is a body there already constituted to deal with this. Okay, it's a self-regulatory body, but nonetheless it is, and has been the custodians of legal services in Scotland for however many years, so why not let them do that? It's not a huge, even if it's 16 companies, that's not a huge company. There's hundreds of solicitors from, so this would be a relatively small part of their, of their remit, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, just very briefly, if the same regulatory environment was to be introduced for claims management companies, the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, which is set up by statute, have to, would have to be brought in well as well. I mean, that would be presumably fairly complicated. I'm sure it could be done. But uh, we need to remember that solicitors are regulated for different purposes by two bodies. In the case of the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, it's got fairly substantial, <coughs> substantial teeth for inadequate professional service. I mean, very briefly, but you know, there's a there's a reason why the financial guidance regulation bill is moving from the MOJ to the Treasury um, for the regulation of claim management companies in England and Wales, and I think that we just touched on some of it there. As I say, we're we're not opposed to it it being done through legal regulation. I think we're a bit sceptical about actually how close the relationship is between some of the claims management companies and the law firms they purport to be part of. And I think the key principle is, regardless of who the regulator is, every claim management company that operates should operate to the same standard. And if some people are regulated by the uh, Law Society and some are regulated by the FCA, we're not going to die in a ditch over that, but it's the principles of regulation that are more important. I'd agree with that. Um, and just to, to touch on your, your initial point, at the moment, claims management activities, it's a service industry, and it's like any other service industry. You, if, if you have a means to, to, to complain about service, in, in, in our own case and other companies that I know of, you, you will make the, the complaint. It will go to a director of the company, and it will be dealt with. There are, if you still cannot receive that, then customers will find a way either of going to a solicitor, ironically, to take advice on it, or the, the, the Legal Services Agency or the Citizens Advice Bureau. I personally have, again, in, in all the years we've been doing this, very, very few uh, genuine complaints. And uh, we've had a couple of instances where people have even gone to, to the papers. Their complaint has been found to be groundless, but people do find ways of, of making their, their voice heard. Um, but uh, I think whether it, whether it becomes a law society matter or having, as I said, registered with the English side of it in the past um, the, and at the time with the Ministry of Justice doesn't really make a great deal of difference. As long as we are all judged by the same standards, then, then I think anybody doing it properly and reputably has nothing to fear. Professor Basil. I think the short answer to your question is who regulates them at the moment is trading standards of anybody. Um, but um, uh, as far as, the, I'm not going to comment about whether the law society do it, I think there's an argument that if you're going to regulate claims management companies, which you should, and I agree with Sarah Principal Taylor on that, there's an argument it should be done on a UK-wide basis because the problems we're having now is people moving up. And so I don't think you want to have a situation where one lot's regulated by one set of regulators and rules, another by another. The argument for uh, a UK-wide regulation sounds to me quite strong. Um, uh, and just remember, the reason why claims management companies were set up in the first place is because there were problems in the regulatory environment uh, from their perspective uh, that damages-based wards weren't allowed under our setup. And secondly, referral fees is a problem. There was a huge fight on Taylor about referral fees. England has swapped these places whether they allow referral fees and then they banned them. Uh, Shared Principal Taylor in the end came to the conclusion that there'd be people, there'd be ways round referral fees, and that's ultimately why we came to where we have. But as you heard from uh, uh, earlier, the, the comment about uh, referral fees, um, you have to do something as a solicitor. You're going to 
pay a referral, get a referral fee. You've got to do something. It's not just something, uh, you know, a, a reward for giving something away. You've got to actually have prepared, done some administrative real work. And the client has to fully understand what the referral fee is about and what it's being paid for. Uh, so referral fees remains an area um, that was contested within Sharon Principal Taylor's uh, report. Okay, Mary. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, much of what I was going to ask about regulation um, has, has been covered, um, and clearly the panel are in agreement that claims management companies need some form of, of regulation. So would you say that this bill is a missed opportunity to not explicitly name claims management companies? I see Mr Doherty's nodding. Would the rest of the panel agree with that? Because the panel will be aware of the, of the, the Scottish Government's view that they could potentially piggyback on, on the, the Westminster um, regulations, but this bill could is, is a missed opportunity. It could have been done here. Just, just clarifying, um, obviously we are not wedded to whether or not it is done mm -hmm through this or through mm -hmm. the bill that is currently going through Westminster, though the clock is ticking, as I say. I think it's mm. about to have its third reading in the Lords and go to the Commons, I suspect, mm. in the new year. So we're not saying it has to be done this way, but it would be astonishing if in the new year we found that we didn't have a mechanism in process mm. to, to regulate. Okay. Yeah. Do any other panel members have any view on that? No? Yeah, I think they're on the of proportion, we're, we're, we're We've mentioned that, that uh, um, was it in the last year, 16 claims management companies have registered at Companies House. Mm. Um, when, when I was, when my firm was registered with the MOG um, for English related activities, English and Wales, um, we um, were one of, at that time, roughly 2,800 registered uh, UK claims management companies. Um, and bear in mind there was very few Scottish firms bothered mm. registering with no requirement to do so. But just to, to, to give you a sense of proportion, 16 claims management companies in Scotland um, is a very, very small number. Um, but I do agree that we should be regulated. But I don't think it's anything to panic about. Um, in England and Wales, I say, I don't know what the, what the current numbers are. I don't receive the don't receive the memos anymore, um, but uh, there as it was something approaching 2,800 registered firms. So even if you took it that we were mm. roughly 10% of the population, you would expect that to be 280 in Scotland, and we're talking about 16 new firms and very few existing firms before that. So sense, sense of perspective mm. should be retained. I mean, the, the, the Scottish Government has argued that claims management companies are covered by the definition of um, a provider of relevant legal services within this bill. But if all of you agree that they should be regulated, am I to suppose then that you don't agree with the Scottish Government's view? Uh, I don't think that, that you can say that we, are, we provide legal services per se. We provide access to legal services. Um, we provide assistance in finding uh, the right path to justice. Um, but we don't, in my own instance, we don't actually provide legal services. So uh, that, that catch-all doesn't really apply, I don't think. Okay. Does anyone else want to make any brief comments before I've got a very, a very short final quick question I wanted to ask? Can, can, can I just ask, panel, then, if, if there is a delay in regulation of claims management companies, however long that may be, is there a potential for any... Um, um, <laughs> problems to occur in people um, that, that are, are looking for services and where they go. And, and we spoke earlier about cowboy companies. Is, is there a potential for cowboy companies to, to slip into a gap that's provided before regulation happens? I see Mr Doherty is furiously nodding. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is, as I say, this is why both WHICH and the ABI are in absolutely the same place on this, is that it, it's absolutely common sense that if England and Wales has a tighter regulatory framework, those less scrupulous firms are going to look and say, well, Scotland isn't you know, having that same regulatory framework. And, it, and, and let's be honest, if, if we are waiting for Esther Robertson's review to, to be published and then have a bill come forward and then be enacted, it could be a significant period of time in which that, that, that vacuum of regulation occurs. So that's, that's absolutely why, as I say, Mrs. Fee, it either needs to be done 
through this bill or done through the financial guidance and claims bill. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, a couple of the panel members have, have made reference to the Esther Robertson review of regulation of legal services, and it certainly will be touching on aspects of this bill which have been um, concerning. So I think the committee, given that there seems to be a lack of progress with that review, the committee will write and ask for an update of exactly where they are and ex um, perhaps make specific reference to the aspects of that review which um, are pertinent to this bill. Ben McPherson. I'll come back to uh, an issue that was raised at the beginning of this evidence session by Paul Brown and, and Thomas Doherty and also in, in which he's written submission. Uh, and that's with regard to part four around group proceedings. Um, there was some discussion earlier, but I'd like to just probe it further, around the alternatives between an opt-in system and an opt-out system. Uh, Mr Doherty, I know you've, in your written evidence and, and earlier, argued that uh, you would prefer an opt-out system and I wondered if you could just explain why you see that as more advantageous. Um, I think that you know, look, what, we're, what we're talking specifically about Mr McPherson are those, those types of claims where the, the detriment to an individual is relatively small but there is a large number of uh, claimants. Um, so if we have an opt-in mechanism what which or indeed a law firm or anyone else would have to do who, who wish to act on behalf of those claimants, they would have to bear all the upfront cost and resource commitment in, in reaching out and trying to find everybody who was potentially affected by uh, that class action, um, advertise widely and then demonstrate to the courts uh, that uh, they were suitable to, to represent those people. Now, that, that is obviously going to be fine where the individual claim is worth, frankly, a huge amount of, of, of redress or compensation. But if it's, a, if it's a relatively small amount of money, then with the best will in the world, um, you, you know, which or law firms or anybody else is really going to struggle um, to, to, to be able to justify uh, that. And I would also add, we've, we've had some interaction with the Scottish Government on this issue, and we are puzzled by their argument, which is that it's too difficult to come up with a system of opt-out. Um, we have opt-out now under the 2015 Consumer Rights Act. Um, it, it I, I would argue it operates effectively for two reasons, because people understand the mechanisms that they have to go through to, to demonstrate that they are acting on behalf of a class of people. And secondly, the bar has not been set to a place where we've seen vexatious claims being brought forward. We're not going to see, I'm showing my age now, a kind of a Boston legal or LA law style mass class actions. We're talking about a relatively small number of cases. And as, as we said in our evidence, Mr McPherson, you know, we've, we've, we, we have cases where either we've done opt-in and we frankly, you know, like the JJB sports football shirts case we could talk about, where we actually weren't able to represent everybody affected because it was an opt-in under the old system. And we've had the opt-out in the last couple of years where there's only two cases so far um, at UK level, the MasterCard case and the disability mobility uh, scooter case, both of which are currently not being preceded because the judge involved said you, you actually haven't met the threshold. So in conclusion, we think opt-in will not lead, will not do anything to help the small cons the, the, the consumer on the individual small amounts of money, um, and it has to therefore be opt-out, and opt-out is a system that does currently work at UK level um, under the CRA. Thank you, that, that's interesting from the consumer perspective. Mr Brown, you touched on earlier on the community perspective in terms of the difference between opt-in and opt-out, and that this interests me as a constituency MSP as well as a, a member of this committee. So I well, if you could elaborate. Well, the Public Health Act petition procedure was most definitely opt-in, and a group of people all concerned with disrepair in a, in a block of housing, and that worked well. But I take the point that um, in something that's more diffuse, people leading it are going to have big expenses in a community situation where people know each other and possibly know the social media to look at and so forth, things will take off. But in a, on a national basis or where there's 
um, significant amount, sorry, smaller amounts of money involved, you can certainly see there'll be problems. My experience of the New York case, that's which I was a beneficiary, it was, it was a, an opt-out, um, and that worked very well. The thing I would be concerned about is that it has taken an inordinate amount of time to get to where we are, and it's a real significant step that we are discussing this, and it would be a pity if the if we, one went for the most ambitious arrangement and it resulted in further delay. So I'm in favour entirely of an opt-out system, but the thing I'm principally in favour of is that there be some form of group proceedings, which I'm sure will help some people. And I can see people taking up quite major issues. I suppose the other issue is that the actions are going to, the Court of Session is going to have exclusive jurisdiction, possibly, uh, and that will be an impediment. I'm not sure that anybody's ever suggested that it should be, I hope I've got that right. Um, I, th I don't think anyone's ever suggested that it should be in the sheriff course as well. I can't see any reason why, but that course of session jurisdiction will be an impediment, having to have Edinburgh agents, costs a lot higher, having to have counsel, or solicitor advocate and so forth. So, in, in, that would be another issue that could be looked at, but as I said, my principal concern is that this system happens. So, so the opt-in system could be of benefit to communities. Yes, but yes, I uh, think so. Yes, uh, yes you, you yes. are you are uh, principally in favour of opt-out. Yeah. If in, in I can a, see could... people taking up group actions, you know, almost immediately um, in a community basis, and I suppose communications are cheaper than they were, but nonetheless, there is an issue. So if someone was to say to me, which I would be in favour of the, you know, going for the most ambitious arrangement, but not if it took five years for the rules to be produced. Well, that's, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, because the, the next point I wanted to, to, to inquire about was around the fact that it's envisaged that the detailed court rules will be developed in consultation with stakeholders. Um, are, you, are you happy with this approach in, in terms of the legislation? Um, I suppose ideally, the more that's in the legislation, the better in principle, but um, as long as there's consultation, and I think one possibly needs to encourage as open consultation as possible, um, that's okay. I mean, it'll be fairly complex. The other area where there needs to be consultation indeed is asking the Lord President to say which charities get pro bono legal expenses. I mean, there needs to be consultation about these things. Um, I don't know that it's part of the Scottish legal tradition to consult widely about rules, but with encouragement, I don't see why it shouldn't be done. People will think our oh, rules just technical stuff, but absolutely there will be substantive and really major issues to do with taking these remedies forward that need to be discussed in as open a way as possible. So generally satisfied with that approach and um, satisfied that uh, an opt-in would, would make a difference? It, well, it would, it would make a difference, yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you. You know, I think it's interesting that the Scottish Government's own, um, uh, I think it was a, the, the, the promotes memorandum, but certainly in their, in their documentation, they've admitted that on opt-in versus opt-out, all the consumer stakeholders argued for opt-out and they've been ignored. So if you're asking me, do I have a great deal of confidence in the Scottish Government's promise on stakeholder consultation latterly? I'm kind of slightly sceptical. Um, we have talked to them. They have said they would, they would be surprised if we weren't asked for our views as part of that working group. That's not the same as a cast iron guarantee that consumers are going to be listened to, Mr. McPherson. Um, you, you know, as I say, don't get me wrong, we are, we, we don't oppose opt-in, it is better than nothing, but it, it is going to do nothing for your constituents who are in a, slow, in, a, in a low individual value, but a big case like dairy, like JJB Sports. So, you know, it's, it's my glass is about a third full, to be honest on this. <laughs> well, um, th thanks very much for, for both of your answers. That was, that was really helpful, because I think it's important that we focus on this bit of the legislation as well as the the other parts of the legislation because it is a, a major step forward in, in Scots law. Did you want to um, ask something, Are there any other, anyone else want to contribute? Yeah, um, I, I would endorse what Mr Doherty says. Um, uh, Opt-in will be helpful, <coughs> but 
Uh, Opt-out has much more impact as the Americans showed it. I mean, in the pre-Uber days in America, they found, if my memory serves me right, the New York yellow taxi cabs were all overcharging across the board. So they didn't say, let's get everybody who's ever used a New York taxi in the last five years to opt into an action. What they did is they included them all in <laughs> and brought the action. Now, they couldn't pay damages to 5 million people, so what they did is they forced the New York taxi companies to lower their fees for the next two years or something. So this, you know, it has a much bigger impact for consumers uh, if you go for opt-out. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just could I clarify, at the beginning of our evidence session, a number of the panels made reference to class actions. The bill refers to group proceedings. Is there a difference? Absolutely not. And just in finishing, the referral um, issue we take on board as being a little grey and looking at the regulation. And can I just again um, highlight the written submission from Mr Doherty, which has some pretty eye-watering figures in terms of three to five billion between April 2011 and November 2015 um, in some of these um, fees charged by... Um, CMCs and the point being made that they, they could perhaps have gone directly to consumers. So it's another aspect, it's there in written evidence, we don't necessarily have to take any evidence on it now. Patterson. Patterson. Professor Patterson. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I, I apologise if we're coming on to it, but the, the, one of the key things about um, group actions is how you fund them. And if, if, if we're not going to have a chance to say something, then I think <laughs> uh, Paul Brown and I would like to say something about them. This, this is only going to work if you can find a way of funding them. The, the, the class actions or group actions are very important things, but you've got to find a way of funding them. Now, uh, legal aid might be one way, but legal aid's set up for individuals. So we've got examples in England and Wales where they have a kind of group action procedure where they had a, a big litigation on behalf of old age pensioners where a drug went wrong or alleged to have gone wrong. Half the people, the thousands of people who were affected were eligible for legal aid and half weren't. And it looked as though for a while the half that were eligible were going to get their claim dealt with because the legal aid would cover them and the half that weren't, they were just going to lose out. They were going to have to be excluded from the action. In the end, a millionaire came out <laughs> of wherever and paid for the, uh, the, the fees of, of, of the the ones who aren't eligible for legal aid, that's no way to run your, uh, your, your system. We have to allow legal aid to, be, uh, 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 to operate in this case, but it will require the regulations to be changed to allow uh, groups to be assessed in, in a way. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And uh, final question, because we have overshot our estimated time. The issue about group legal aid has been a, always been a major problem and it isn't just to do with this field, it's also environmental matters and the problem about one person representing a group of people and then the legal aid board saying, well, the group of people's circumstances need to be assessed as well. There is a need for thinking outside the box on that particular issue. Okay. And Ben, did you have something? No, I, I was just interested to hear when uh, Professor Patterson put up his hand on the issues he's, he's now elaborated so, on, that's so fine. thank you. That concludes our line of question. Can I thank the panel very much for what's been a very worthwhile uh, evidence session. I suspend briefly to allow a change over of witnesses and a comfort break. <laughs>
Hamilton. Agenda item five is offensive behaviour and football and threatening communications repeal Scotland bill. This is our fourth evidence session on the bill and I refer members to paper five, which is note by the clerk, and paper six, which is a private um, paper. And I again uh, welcome our regular visitor to the committee, James Kelly, the member in charge of the bill. Also welcome An Andrew Tickell, lecturer in law, Glasgow U Caledonian University. Dr. Joseph Webster, lecturer in anthropology at Queen's University, Belfast. Dr. Stuart Wayton, Senior Lecturer, Division of Sociology, School of Social and Health Sciences, the University of Aberdeen in Dundee, and Dr. John Kelly, Lecturer in so Sport Policy Management and International Development at the University of Edinburgh. And can I thank um, all the witnesses for providing written submissions. These really are very helpful when we're preparing to, to take evidence from you to have these written submissions. We move straight to, to questions and can I start by asking the members if they wish to comment on the general terms of the proposal, uh, just very general, not going into too much detail, but general terms on the proposal and if they can see any merit in the legislation who'd like to kick off. Don't all rush at once. Right, Mr. Uh, just to Dr. clarify, Webster. are you essentially asking us to comment on yes, whether or not we support the repeal yes, and if so, why? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So, from my perspective, there are uh, three compelling reasons why the repeal should go forward. Uh, the first, as I outlined in my submission, is that the legislation is currently unworkable on practical terms, and having reviewed the uh, earlier oral uh, submissions, the transcripts of those submissions, I was very uh, interested to see um, Assistant Chief Constable Higgins' response to a question that Liam Kerr asked, where the question was essentially what happens when um, an entire stand breaks out in chanting, mm -hmm. and the response was what we do is we use CCTV to identify uh, the kind of main protagonists and only arrest those. So the, the, the point here is that the police are themselves giving evidence suggesting this is a mass phenomena and that arresting only individuals is, is possible, therefore, if the legislation were followed to its fullest extent, there would need to be mass arrests, and that's simply not happening because it can't happen. So the first point, I suppose, is that practically this legislation is unworkable. The second point, uh, more briefly, is that uh, the legislation is not justified on free speech grounds. Uh, part uh, 6.5 of the legislation does restrict part 7.1b, the Legislation essentially says that uh, it makes uh, acts of hatred uh, illegal, but it does not restrict antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, or abuse. And the key problem here is that there is uh, insufficient ability to parse those uh, behaviors, uh, as uh, evidenced again in earlier oral submissions, whereby police are needing to be trained on how to interpret uh, those different behaviors and how to classify any given uh, behavior is either hateful or perhaps abusive, and where do we draw the line there? Uh, and thirdly, um, and this is a, a slightly finer point, but I think it's absolutely essential, is that the Act fails to understand uh, the types of behaviors that it is attempting to make illegal, not only as a type of uh, performance, which the repeal bill outlines on uh, page 10, I think that's a very important point, but not only from my perspective, based on uh, my five years of ethnographic research on this topic, not only is this type of behavior a performance, but crucially, the um, bill as it currently stands does not uh, take into account who the audience of that performance is. And as I wrote in my written submission, my point is that the types of chanting, the types of banners, the types of behaviors that the 2012 Act seeks to criminalize fails to understand that those types of behaviors are actually offered to uh, 
uh, fans of their own side, essentially. So, so these behaviors are not primarily an attempt to enrage an opposing side. Actually, what's going on here within uh, these types of behaviors is an attempt to build um, intra-group solidarity, single fan bases communicating things to each other to affirm their own collective belonging, rather than an attempt to enrage uh, an opposite fan base. The, the, the empirical evidence for this is pretty clear. The vast majority of this type of behavior uh, occurs either in single stands where fans are strictly segregated or indeed in uh, pubs and social clubs where the opposing fan base is simply absent. Mm -hmm. So uh, the point stands that this is about single fan bases building collective identity amongst themselves, not primarily an attempt to uh, enrage the opposite side, who in most cases are simply absent from the situation. Thank you. Other comments on um, the general position on the bill? Who wants to go next? Yes, go. Dr. Kelly. Thank Kelly. you. Um, well, I would, I would also support the repeal of, of the bill um, because I think some of the warnings that were highlighted actually before the original bill have come to fruition. Most namely, I think, is this still in Scotland, this misunderstanding of what it is we're trying to police or legislate for when the word sectarian rears its head. And now I noticed the original bill didn't have the word sectarian mentioned in it, but nevertheless, much of the public commentary on this frames it as an anti-sectarian bill. And I think there's problems with this in the way that, the way that it's being policed and legislated, because what it does is it actually, in reality, it does, potentially does the opposite, in fact, of what the original bill sought to do, i.e. the original bill sought to protect ethnic, national, and a variety of other identities, sexual, gendered, um, disability, and so on. And, and what that does in Scotland, when people, when certain people from both of the, the major, I suppose, groups within the sectarian divide in Scotland, when, when those groups exhibit elements of what they believe, and I would argue quite correctly in many respects, are their national identities, diaspora group attachments and identities, that, that these are legitimate identities for um, diaspora groups. And rather than being protected in actual fact, as, as the original bill sought to protect, some of these groups are actually being um, accused of inciting hatred and intolerance um, and, in, and you know, performing offensive behavior. Now, that's not to suggest that some of these national identities can have intolerance attached to them, but that's the key for me. We don't, we don't seek to police or protect um, gay and, and homosexual and lesbian communities with this bill or any other bill by stopping people expressing elements of their gay identity. And this is a crucial, but it's a subtle, but it's a crucial distinction. In Scotland, when we seek to police and legislate and stop what some people perceive to be negative around sectarianism, sectarian behaviour. They confuse sectarianism, they confuse intolerance and hatred towards the other based on the belief of the other person's religious or national identity. And that's different from policing someone exhibiting elements of a national identity. And this is, this is what's been happening in Scotland, particularly with um, some of the fans that are being arrested for two or three different songs. That, that in actual fact, that in actual fact don't... Um, mention any intolerance or hatred of anybody else's protected characteristics that are actually in the original bill. So I think that's, that's a key element for me, that, and, and offensiveness itself is open to interpretation. And the nature of racism, bigotry, homophobia, um, and, and the, the, other, the other isms, if you like, um, with regard to the other protected groups. The nature of these problems is that it's very subtle. Some of the, some of the, the prejudices are very subtle to such an extent that it's difficult even for, for the police and the law courts to agree on what actually is and is not offensive. So I, I would support the repeal for those and indeed some other reasons, but they're the main reasons. Okay. Professor Dicker? Not professor. You promoted me in that context. Oh, I'm grateful for it. Oh but, well. Um, <laughs> and you'd get your name wrong somehow or other. <laughs> well, I thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate the effort. Um, 
Thank you for inviting me here again today. My attitude towards this legislation is probably unpopular with more or less um, all of you. I think this is a bad piece of legislation. I think in parts it reads like magic realism. I think the legal criticisms of great parts of this bill are very well founded. And I think the response that this parliament should make to those failures in the bill is to uh, amend it and fix the problems with it rather than straightforwardly repealing it. I think it's actually quite straightforward to transform the offensive behaviour at Football Act, particularly section one of the legislation that's been the focus of uh, the session thus far, into a pretty mainstream public order um, offence. So you do have the opportunity to do that. If you choose not to, then obviously that's your, that's your choice. But I think there are big problems with it. But it is using a sledgehammer for a task for which a scalpel is better, better devised, I would argue, um, to completely uh, strike this act aside, particularly in the context of uh, a fact which a number of the witnesses you've heard from have already mentioned, which is Lord Brackadale's own ongoing uh, hate crime review. I think in that context, it seems to me it would be more sensible to make amendments where the act is bad and to uh, listen to what Lord Brackadale has to say about the future of hate crime in Scotland and then revisit those issues. That, in a nutshell, is more or less my attitude. Right. Dr. Wheaton. Yeah, um, well, as you know, I, I, I oppose this. Um, I, I think it has to be put more um, generally in terms of the the sort of political culture as well, in terms of what we're looking at. Um, because there's a, a key element of this, I think, where you could describe it as part of creating what you could call a safe space society. So a society where um, people learn that if they say certain words, they will be shunned, possibly sacked, or arrested in the case of football fans which is essentially what this is, I think, this bill. We, we hide behind this public order issue. But essentially, this is the criminalization of words and thoughts and the arresting and imprisoning of people because you don't like uh, their words. And I was listening, interestingly, on Radio 4, they were talking about the Profumo affair and Christine Keeler in the 1950s, sort of early 60s, and uh, obscenity and the use of the idea of obscenity. And it's often quite difficult, I find, to try and explain what we're looking at with acts like this, because they seem to be political, because they talk about things like racism and sectarianism. But at the same time, it also seems to me much more to be a form of etiquette and training of correct behaviour. So I watched the last discussion, and you're constantly talking about behaviour. Yeah, the behaviour, the behaviour of fans. We don't usually talk about the behaviour of murderers or rapists, because cr crime is a crime and you talk about their crimes, but you're talking about really educating their behaviours in quite a school uh, arguably patronising way. We need to make these people aware uh, of how they should behave. And it seems to be an, a real element of this is, is around etiquette and what is seen as correct civil or uh, 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 civic behaviour, if you like. And I, I, I think it would be useful when you talk about things like racism and sectarianism, I think really what we're saying is that this is, we find racism obscene and we find homophobia obscene because it really does smack with me that this is a bit like the 1950s and a, a type of conformism that's, and conservatism that's being forced on uh, society. And I think this bill is probably the best example of it, um, possibly in Europe, possibly in the world in terms of an illustration of a new type of politically correct form of policing uh, of civility in society. Right. Fulton, is it very brief? Yeah, uh, yeah. it's actually just a... a... So thanks very much to, to all the panel for the uh, submissions so far. It was to pick up on a point that Dr Webster made, something that I think is the first time we've sort of heard that angle on things, that mm -hmm. actually people who are um, engaging in songs and behaviour are doing so... Uh, to their own fans, supporters. But um, I think that goes against what a lot of the evidence that we heard was people saying that they were actually put off going to games because of that. So they may be a fan or supporter of that club and then choose not to go because of the offensive behaviour. And I think we all know, I mean, I know personally from the experience from, say, for example, um, Rangers and Celtic fans that I know who are saying quite clearly, and we'll all have anecdotal evidence of this, I wouldn't go to Parkhead or Ibrox because of this behaviour. And interestingly, when they become fathers as well, or mothers, they say, I'm not going to take my son or daughter 
to those places either. So I wonder how that fits in with your, with your overall analysis that they're, they're, they're not offending MD because they're talking to each other. So I want to clarify, I'm not in any way saying that they're not offending anyone. Uh, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is we need to understand the motive behind the behavior. We are assuming that these types of uh, songs and chanting and displays of banners and other symbols are specifically designed to bring about maximum offense. I'm simply saying that if you spend time conducting the type of ethnographic research that I do among people who uh, engage in these types of behaviors, you quickly realize that their primary intended motivation is not to offend the other, but is to build bonds of sociality between each other. Uh, your point is well taken that that does not then preclude the possibility that other people listening on might indeed find some of those things to be uh, offensive. My point is that we are um, attributing false motivations often, and I think this legislation does that, to those who engage in this type of behavior. And that's an important point, because if we reconfigure our understanding of what motivates this type of behavior, it might well then assist us, it might well assist you as a panel, to try and figure out what the best way forward is, whether it's amending the legislation or bringing in something else. My point is that I'm not convinced that that any of us fully understand what is going on within the kind of social world of the people who engage in these behaviors. And without that understanding, without really understanding what's happening, we can't act to correct it or to deal with it or to police it or indeed to politely ignore it. Whatever course of action is deemed to be most useful. My, my, my point is that we don't understand the types of behaviors that this legislation is trying to deal with. It, and and uh, the reason I come in with a supplementary is I actually thought your, your point was well made and it, it was made in a different way that we hadn't, hadn't heard before but just um, to give my understanding mm. of the act before becoming an MSP and since was it was to incorporate offensive behaviour uh, for everybody so I, I wasn't somebody that, all, that, that thought necessarily the offensive behaviour had to be to an opposing group of fans and an opposing group of uh, individuals actually I thought it was mainly to protect folk who were actually off the same supporter um, I, I, so it, it was just interesting to hear that mm. angle and to, and to suggest so where that's different people may come from it with. That's certainly not my understanding of how the people who I've spent time researching yeah. among would understand the legislation. They see themselves as the victim of this legislation because they see themselves as the one being policed against. Now, whether or not that's the case, from my perspective as an ethnographer, is beside the point. The point in terms of how this legislation is interpreted by those who think of themselves as the victim of this type of legislation, it then has all sorts of unintended consequences about how they relate to the police, how they relate to each other, and that's something that I'm sure we'll go on to talk about later. But the understanding the kind of internal social life of the groups that are being targeted by this legislation is essential in order to figure out how this legislation will or will not work, and also what are the unintended consequences that it's bound to have. Dr. Whitty. Yeah, um, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that you, know, you try and get a ticket for an old firm game, you have to bite somebody's hand off for it. So people are queuing up to get to these games. And the viewing figures when these games are on television are bigger than any other game. So, you know, there might be some people who are offended by this. Mm -hmm. There seems to be an awful lot of people that are desperate to watch these games, as I would be uh, if Rangers were any good uh, and it would be worth watching. But um, I think it's also worth bearing in mind that you don't have to go to Celtic Rangers type game to find people who have found football uh, offensive. <laughs> I, I grew up in Newcastle. I knew lots of people who wouldn't touch football with a barge pole, uh, people who generally saw themselves as more respectable uh, than that. Because uh, football was seen as uncouth, and to some extent it is uncouth. Uh, and that's what a lot of people love about it, because it is offensive, in your face, sweary, shouty atmosphere. And some people don't like that. So you don't have to go to an old firm game to find people who are offended by football. And you've also had a lot of snobbery about that. The Times had a a nice article in the 1980s that said uh, football is a slum game watched in slum stadiums by slum people. And I think there remains a snobbery about football fans, except that today it takes a more politically correct form. Uh, so I think if we're looking at people who are offended by football fans, sometimes we can look at prejudice and bigotry towards fans rather than just take this uh, as, as uh, yeah, good on good faith. 
Okay. Um, I've allowed quite a lot of latitude. That was a, a, a supplementary, and we have a, a lot of questions to get through in a limited time. So uh, we'll move on. Rona. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, I suppose my questions, my initial um, questions, really for Dr. Wayton. We've heard from the evidence from the Women's Convention, disability groups, and equality groups, who all say that they feel protected by this legislation and actually fear the repeal of it. Does their View, do their views matter to you? So it was women's disability and what was the other group? Convention. Women's convention. And no. disability groups. Disability alliance. Was there another one? I thought it was three. Equality, uh, sorry, LGBT. LGBT, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have lots of problems with this, actually. Lots of problems. Um, because I don't think these groups are representative. I don't think they're elected. Um, they seem to be special interest groups. <laughs> and I do think that there seems to be a problem that, uh, at the minute, especially in the framework of identity politics, that groups uh, like this need to be represented and to represent themselves in a, a kind of prism of victimhood. And it's very rare, I think, it'd be almost, I suspect you almost never find one of these groups that don't demand there needs to be more awareness or there needs to be more laws or more regulations because there is a tendency within a framework of identity politics to represent yourselves uh, as victims. And actually, I think this is a very good example of the new type of political correct conformity and prejudice, actually, by football fans. That there is a presumption that football fans are bigots, racists, sexists, homophobes, and uh, don't like disabled people, uh, and so on. And then we get uh, these groups represented by tiny numbers of people who come forward and say, oh yes, I find this a problem. And I think that is grotesquely patronising to football fans who, in my experience and through social, you know, uh, social attitude surveys and all the rest of it, Britain, Scotland in general is a far more tolerant, far less racist, far less homophobic society than it ever has been. Uh, and yet we get football fans represented in a way where we are essentially saying there is this sort of seething bigotry just waiting to get out here. And if we don't have more and more laws, there's a problem. And I find it interesting that we don't seem to approach this to rugby fans or opera goers or anybody else. It seems to be football fans where it's the white working class mainly going there. And I think this is the big prejudice that we should really explore uh, as sociologists, is your prejudice that's being represented as football fans, essentially as potentially violent bigots. I don't identify with actually anything that you've said there, to be quite honest. You're, you're essentially disregarding the evidence that we've heard from groups who are not, uh, you know, protest groups. They're, they're members of, of community who like to enjoy football like everyone else, so equality matters. And so I, I, I fundamentally disagree with you. But my main question is really to the, the, the whole panel, and it's something that Andrew uh, Tickell mentioned, and it's uh, Lord Brackadale's um, review of hate crime legislation. Um, I think Mr Tickell's made his, 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 uh, his, his view on that one. Would the rest of you agree that it would be sensible to wait until that's completed next spring before repealing this, if we are to repeal this act? No, no, I think, I think the, the bill is, is, has shown that it's unfit for purpose, actually. But I, I, do, I actually do agree, to some extent, with the Women's Convention and disability and lesbian and gay and bisexual and trans groups' rights. I, I agree that those rights need to be protected. But my question to that would be, I wonder what the figures are for the current arrests and convictions, and indeed non-convictions, for offences at football since the bill's been, the original bill's been in power, um, for offences against those groups, because I suspect, and again, like my colleagues here have, have actually done research and, and I do ethnographic research also with these groups, I'm not aware of any mm -hmm. case where it's, where, it's been, where it's been for those causes, but that's not to say that we, we should, you know, we shouldn't protect those people, but if the bill, if there's a bill that's that's flawed and faulty for, if we, if we do agree, agree that it is indeed, you know, I know that's not in complete agreement, but if it is agreed that the bill is flawed and faulty, I don't think it's a good enough reason to hold on to it because there's a fear 
from some minority groups that, that they, they feel that it's protected, then I think we could come up with something better, quite frankly. And as I say, I'm not entirely sure that it's people from those groups that have been the that, that have that have been that people have been arrested for attacking. I, I, I don't it's, think I it's think actually it's about more. people being arrested. It's about people feeling comfortable, like yeah. everyone else, to, to be able to go and watch and enjoy football. Yes, I don't think my, it's about who was but, arrested. But my point is, I don't know. I don't know why those people from those groups don't feel comfortable to go and watch football as a result of this bill. That's the key. I mean, they may not feel comfortable going to watch the football. Is sure, and my colleague um, Fulton has mentioned actually that, that you know some people aren't comfortable going to football for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm not sure how this bill, and, and perhaps perhaps people can enlighten us here. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why this bill is giving this women's group, uh, I, I suppose, comfort or, or um, as encouraging them to feel that they'll be safe and secure at football. Um, because I, I just don't see how that that bill's helping with that. I'm not, I'm not sure it's for you to question how they feel. You know, that's. Well, well, but it's funny if I can just chip in there. You see, if. If someone came in here and said, oh, I feel really uncomfortable in a group of, with a, when I sit amongst a group of got black people, we would think they were kind of, they, they were potentially bigots and you would question their fear. But the other groups say, I sit amongst a group of football fans and I feel scared. And you just take that as good coin, right? And you don't question that actually perhaps that's, their, their fear isn't legitimized. It's certainly not legitimized by any of the statistics that I've seen in terms of attacks on gay people black people, women at football games, zero as far as I can tell. That's not true. I think there's two incidents of homophobic arrests as far as I'm aware. But you take that fear as good coin, right? Instead of saying, well, actually, perhaps we shouldn't just accept fear of other people as legitimate, but perhaps that just fits into our own prejudices and then it goes unquestioned. I think the original question was on the bracket there, wasn't it? But never mind. Yeah. Yes, I think we've got the answers uh -huh. for that one, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. um, Mr. Tickell, do you have a view on the equality aspect of it? Um, I similarly, I think that there's an awful lot of discussion around this bill around messages and as a lawyer this disturbs me because the bill has content that I think we need to address as well, whether we're for or against um, getting rid of this legislation. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it seems very likely that Lord Brackadale will come up with a comprehensive hate crime uh, bill which you'll be invited to consider or proposals around that. It's a mess as an area of law at present. There's no tidy-minded lawyer who'd ever look at the current law and not think the solution to this is a bill which possibly comprehensively uh, deals with incitement uh, to hatreds of various kinds. Uh, as the law stands at the moment, uh, south of the border we have incitement to racial hatred recognised, we have incitement to LGBT hatred and we have religious hatred uh, covered by English legislation. Those last two categories don't apply in Scotland. I think this parliament will come under considerable uh, pressure from Lord Brackadale. I, I'm, I'm prejudging his report, but I'd be very surprised if he doesn't come out with a proposal for extensive hate crime legislation. And I, I would be quite surprised, frankly, if most of the people in this parliament who are going to vote to abolish the Football Act don't back broadly what Lord Brackadale suggests. And I find that logically a little difficult to reconcile um, as things stand. We'll see. Maybe the judge will surprise us and come up with different uh, perspectives on that. <coughs> Mary, uh, a brief supplementary, and it's probably going to be less supplementary given we're way behind. In okay, thank question. you, convener. I'll try and be as brief as possible because I th do think that we really have to uh, sort out some of the, the terminology and the words that are being used in the meeting so far today. So I do take great exception to some of the assertions made by, uh, by Dr. Wayton. Now, I don't think you'll find anybody around this table that would say that all football fans are bigots, homophobic and racist. There are pockets and elements of that that exist. I mean, for example, we had the incident on a train a couple of weeks ago where fans were singing homophobic songs and, and that kind of thing. So it does happen. But to actually dismiss the other evidence that we've heard uh, in dismissing this women's group, I think, as Dr. Kelly said, and talking about how grossly patronising it is. I mean, I think it's grossly patronising to refer to the evidence that these groups have given uh, in, the con in the context that you have. And I do think that when we've been discussing this bill, it seems like the evidence that these groups have given has been analysed in a way that we haven't done in, in other bills and completely picked apart. And we're made to think that because they don't represent 100% of people, then their opinion doesn't matter. Now, when we look at other legislation, such as the Domestic Abuse Bill, we have organisations such as Women's Aid, Children First, who represent 
the views of the people that they come into contact with. Of course, that's not going to be 100% of people, but that doesn't mean that their views don't matter. And that is the basis on which this, this legislation is determined. And I do think, as I say, it's grossly unfair to say that the organisations we've heard evidence from, that their concerns don't matter at all. Because my question was going to be that the fact that if this bill is repealed, what message all these groups are concerned at the message that that sends out about what is acceptable and what kind of behaviour we could potentially be condoning and to get your response to that. Um, because, like I say, I do take great exception to some mm. of the assertions that have been made so far this morning. Dr Wheat. Yeah, well, as a criminologist, you always try and look at things about are fears real? Okay, so in the 1970s, there was a panic about black muggers uh, and sociology look, sociologists looked at that and said, is this real or is this, is this prejudice? I think we should do the same thing when other groups say that they have fears about other groups in society. But we don't do that. We don't do that because there's a certain etiquette and political framework where these groups are seen as that's, they're on the side of good and they're on the side of bad. So I do think there is a, a genuine prejudice there. So, for example... The idea of old firm domestic violence became an established term. Uh, and then I, I worked out the number of cases this referred to. And there were more newspaper articles than the number of cases that, refer, that, that were being referred to. I then tried to calculate, and this was a conservative estimate, how many football fans in Strathclyde, football fans in general, were, were involved in domestic violence incidents that led to an arrest. I calculated that this was... 0.0003% of fans, which meant that 99.9997% of fans had nothing to do with domestic violence that led to arrest on the days when we started to talk about domestic violence. Now, if these statistics were used about any other group in society where you have terms being bandied around and groups of fans being associated with things like domestic violence, it would be seen as a moral panic. Dr. Webster. Can I respond directly to the question of um, what message does this send if the legislation is repealed? I think that's an excellent question. I think it's a really important question for the panel to consider. My understanding is that the message it would send would be that this legislation is not fit for purpose. And the wider point here is that just because the faulty legislation has I think the panel in general agree that the legislation has very significant problems. Just because a piece of legislation that is faulty is repealed does not mean that you are necessarily affirming the validity of the types of behaviours that the bill is trying to restrict and criminalise. The way in which this is uh, perceived is something that is essentially all of our collective responsibility to deal with. To say that this legislation should not be repealed because it might send a problematic message to potential offenders is not a good enough reason not to repeal it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that that message might not be taken into account. I think it should be taken into account. We do need to think about what will happen if and when this piece of legislation is repealed. But to say that the legislation should not be repealed largely because it might potentially send a negative message to some potential offenders is a dangerous line to go down. I think we need to grasp the nettle and either repeal or dramatically alter the uh, legislation and simultaneously have a plan to deal with what type of message uh, public society should be receiving as a result of those actions. Right, we really have to move on now. George Adams. perspective of the reason why we ended up with the, the bill itself. You know, in 2011 we had the so-called game of shame, where effectively uh, that has been used by a lot of the uh, supporters groups as uh, that was the reason that made the, it made the legislation happen. But we all know there was an ongoing it was building up to that with three or four games before that where things were getting out of control as well. Because in that game alone, there was 34 arrests at the game, of which 16 were sectarian and 229 in the Strathclyde area. So, and one of the other things is during the old firm uh, cup tie, uh, there is actually, they're driving up domestic abuse rates of 43%, according to the police. Uh, 
In 2000, uh, during that game, there was 210 reported incidents, as opposed to a normal 146 on the same day normally. So is this not an example with all that and the fact we have the Jewish community and Stonewall and Scottish Disabled Supporters Association saying that they feel protected by this bill? Is that not the case that, you know, when you look at it that way, the government was probably right to legislate on this? Who'd like to start off with that one? Well, I mean, I'm happy to address that. I think um, that often the, the principles behind this bill are, some people would say they support them. I think it's undeniable that this bill was extremely badly handled by the Scottish Government, that they raced it through Parliament with limited scrutiny, they added additional provisions late on, which actually are frequently the most problematic provisions of this legislation, and they specifically highlighted in Section 5 those areas that are particularly problematic. They give the Government the power to knock out the particularly problematic sections here. I suppose the question is, uh, is it important that we have the criminalisation of offence as opposed to the kind of criminalisation that was undertaken under classic uh, breach of the peace provisions. I'm not sure I'm persuaded, along with a number of other people, that we need to criminalise offence for starters, but people will disagree about that to some extent. I'm not sure that this legislation, for the reasons which a number of fellow panellists have given, have succeeded comprehensively in addressing these issues. And perhaps it's a suggestion that criminal law isn't perhaps the best tool to, to try and uh, change society in this kind of way. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure this is a, an unvarnished success from the Scottish Government's perspective. It's turned a very difficult area of talking about sectarianism in Scotland into an ever more uh, kind of hothouse environment. And heaven knows, you know, it was a particularly hot issue for starters. So I'm not sure, uh, looking at, across the piece, that this has been a great, a great triumph. Nonetheless, despite all of my reservations, we can fix this bill. We can fix this Act of Parliament. It's easy for the Scottish Government to do so if it chooses to do so. Thus far, there's no evidence the Scottish Government uh, wants to uh, amend, this, amend this bill, and I find that um, a somewhat disappointing fact. Other views? Uh, Dr uh, Kelly? Uh, coming back to George Adams' point, um, with regard to the so-called shame game, there were other issues, of course, around, around that time um, with Neil Lennon and, and other, I suppose, sectarian-related um, issues. So it wasn't, as colleagues probably know, it wasn't simply that game. But in answer to your question about what can we do about, about that sectarianism, make a bill that deals with sectarianism. Don't make a bill that deals with offensiveness, which, which is open to question and in actual fact doesn't, doesn't actually specify for any of us around this table or the police or the courts actually truly specify what, what this country thinks is sectarian and what is sectarianism. Again, I keep coming back to this because this is crucial. It, is, it should not be illegal for people to have a sectarian identity. That should not be illegal. And there's confusion and misunderstanding about that in this country. It's when one's identity whether it's sectarian or not as an identity, it's when that identity is exhibiting intolerance or hatred towards someone else's identity based on religion or any of the other protected characteristics. And I, I certainly I, I do <coughs> certainly support, as I said earlier, the, the protection of those other characteristics um, in a properly worded bill. Uh, and I'm also, Rowan, I'm also very conscious, and, and in fact, Mary, I'm very conscious that we're sitting here as a, a bunch of white males pontificating on this, so I, I, certainly, I certainly don't mean, mean to cause any offence to the women's groups, and I, I'm actually on record as supporting the protection of women's rights, gay rights, um, all sorts of disability rights and minority rights at football. I just don't think this bill does that. Okay, uh, just, uh, just my final question is just the fact that, uh, Dr Waiting, you actually say in your own evidence here, you've got a part where you say people should be able to express their hatred of whoever they like, as part of your own evidence here. Uh, you've also uh, been part of a contributor to a book called Football Hooliganism, Fan Behaviour and Crime, which you've said in many respects being offensive is football. You know, the simple question to that is, are you saying that anybody can say whatever they like, whenever they like, no matter how offensive someone finds that? Yeah, I mean, I know it's, <clears throat> I'm a bit of a, an extremist like this, but, I don't think you should arrest people for speaking words. I know it's crazy in a liberal free society that, you know, uh, but there you have it. If someone sings a song, I don't think you should call the police and put them in prison for that. Um, 
you know, I mean, unlike well, do, most... Dr. Wheaton, can I just... just uh, uh, unlike, I, unlike most of you, let me finish? I was then, actively then involved again, in anti-racist politics. The first newspaper I sold was in defence of gay rights. As it happens, I think it's strange that we talk about protecting people. You know, we, in fact, was it Ian McGuirter? Ian McGuirter, that extremist who said the Scottish Government would, should realise that the right to offend is the most basic right in a free society. So yes, it's, it's true. In a liberal, free society, different ideas and views should be expressed. And if you disagree with them, you should challenge those views with politics, with campaigns, with articles. When was the last time you were out on the street handing out a leaflet? Perhaps you should do that, talk to ordinary people. So yes, I don't think you should put people in prison for the words that they speak. Shock. Can I just say, Dr. Waiton, but one of the things that, uh, as a football fan, uh, as one fan for my sins, uh, I've actually, uh, I remember a time back in the 80s when someone were actually playing in European football and Ruud Hullett came along to with Feyenoord and he said it was the worst racism he'd ever experienced in his whole career. He still on record actually mentions that day in Love Street as one of the worst. Now that was wrong then and I knew as a, a young man just in primary school at that point it was wrong to do that then? Is it not the case that there has to be some form of where people have to control themselves and they can't just say whatever they like at any point, and particularly when there's groups at football games well, as well? Wh wh why do we assume that this is a problem in football now? Right. It's, I, th I think it was 2001, the statistics from England were there were 17 cases out of 13 million people, which amounted to, again, something like 0.003. And you seem to be suggesting that if we didn't have the police hanging around people's necks, they'd all be racist animals. No, what I'm concerned I, I is what you've said, true. Mr. Waiting. People yes, should I, be I, able to express their hatred of whoever they like. Yeah. I find that quite offensive myself. Yeah. Well, that is that's a, that's a, that's is the nature of free societies, that people express things. But the way you would deal with that is not by putting people in prison for the views that they hold or the words that they say. That is how a free society is meant to operate. If the clubs want to do something about it, that's different, they're private institutions and they could do, do something else. But the state and the police should not be involved in the policing of language and thought. That is the most basic aspect of a free society, which unfortunately we have completely lost, it seems. We have to move on now. There's no time for supplementaries, I'm sorry. Um, Liam. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I was fascinated by the analysis of the underlying legislation that the, the panel submitted, actually, uh, and the assumptions that I think are inherent in what we've done. Uh, just drawing that to a practical level, though, uh, if I may, if we accept, we, th this panel's heard a, a deal of evidence that suggests that there has been a reduction of the singing of songs in the stands. Uh, so do you take a view, do any of the panel take a view on whether the underlying values, the underlying societal beliefs have changed? And if so, is that as a result of this legislation? Uh, and in any event, does that imply that if you take the legislation away, the underlying belief, the underlying mischief is still there waiting to spring back almost? Who else did? So uh, having done extensive ethnographic work on exactly this question, I would dispute that there has been a dramatic decline in the singing of certain songs. I think what fans have done is changed their behavior. They have held their hands in front of their mouths while they sing certain songs in order to prevent CCTV from capturing them doing so. They have, as we're all aware, replaced certain songs and chants with other words in order to try and uh, skirt the law. So my sense is that one of the major problems with this legislation is exactly the type of phenomena that you're, you're putting your finger on here, is what is the behavioral change that this bill brings about? Does this, does this bring about behavioral change? Yes, it does, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't um, change or um, discourage the expressions of the types of behavior that the Act seeks to, to, to do away with. It doesn't make people less offensive. It, it makes them engage in uh, behavior that the Act regards as offensive in a different way. It, it redirects those types of behaviors rather than prevents them from happening. And I think that is a feature of 
the legislation in the way that it's been drafted, but also more problematically, or maybe not more problematically, um, more fundamentally, uh, what we're coming up against here is something that, that all of us have already discussed, that maybe legislation is not the best way to deal with the types of behavior that the Act is trying to prohibit. Uh, laws might be less effective than, for instance, early years education, which is, I would imagine, a, a fairly uncontroversial suggestion. Has the singing decreased? No, it's been redirected. Is the law working? No, we need to replace it, I would say, with other methods of behavioral change, probably the most sensible being early years education. Uh, I, I think it has had an impact. Um, I, I'm not, it's difficult to um, quantify because it comes with a much wider climate. Um, so, for example, uh, um, my student association passed a no-platform bill uh, a few years ago, and the opening sentence said, this union notes that racism is illegal. So the people that were drafting that bill thought that racism was illegal. Right? Now, in case anyone's confused here, racism isn't illegal. Right? You are allowed to be a racist. Um, you're just not allowed to speak in relation to that. So, and my concern in relation to this is that I think you create a climate where people are frightened to talk about certain things or a little bit nervous. I think there's also a problem with this terms like protected characteristics. I mean, it reminds me of a kind of zoo where we've got these different groups sort of chain, you know, walled off against each other. Because it seems to be helping to create a more sort of fragmented, slightly more distant society. And I remember that Scotland used to have a, it would say, one Scotland, many cultures. And then they got rid of the many cultures at a time when there was concerns about whether multiculturalism was actually creating kind of separate communities, especially amongst the Muslim community. And the many cultures bit disappeared because uh, there was a nervousness about that. So I do think that it, 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 this and other bills like this are, are having an impact on society. They are having a kind of a, a sort of etiquette, censorious impact in terms of what can be discussed. And I think it turns things like anti-racism, unfortunately, into a mantra where you just say no to racism, but you never discuss it. You never actually have arguments about it. You never actually are in a position where people will actually be, feel free to have a proper debate and actually develop proper anti-racist ideas and understandings. Okay, uh, Dr. Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I th that last point certainly, Stuart. I, I, I agree with that completely. I just, I'd, I would take take issue certainly a, a little bit with the assertion that there's there's been less, um, I suppose, problematic songs at football games. I would argue certainly. Um, as someone who has been to quite a number of Celtic games over the last few years, both in my own personal life and as an ethnographic observer. Um, I would argue, and I think most Celtic fans certainly would argue, that since this bill's come in, there's been actually more what the Scottish Government might define as problematic songs. There's been more songs sung at Celtic Park and indeed away from Celtic Park where Celtic have been playing. Um, that are of an Irish nationalist and an Irish Republican nature than was previously the case leading up to the bill. And in actual fact, it was the case for quite a number of years that at Celtic Park, you, you would struggle actually to hear the, some of the old Irish nationalist songs that were sung right through the, 70s, the 60s, 70s and 80s. Songs like Boys of the Old Brigade, for example, um, that mention the IRA and indeed are about ver various versions of the IRA or Irish nationalists or Republicans, if you prefer. And those songs were actually disappearing from the mainstream Celtic support. And this bill came in and they've, they've actually <laughs> they've become more popular in many ways, almost as an act of defiance in some respects that the state, to some extent, in agreement with Stuart, certainly some of the fans that sing it, we shouldn't be told by the state. They would say, perhaps, that what we should sing, what the state shouldn't be controlling people's songs. And I, and I just I think, to some extent, 
probably the, just possibly the same with Rangers. I'm not I'm not so sure if it applies to Rangers as much, or, or indeed any other clubs that this may affect, Hearts or Hibs, for example. Um, but I, I suspect that part of the I suppose the encouragement to sing these songs, or the motivation to sing these songs after the bill, was to show that they thought the bill was unfair, and they thought the bill in actual fact was prohibiting them from expressing elements of their national identity. A national identity people in this room might not understand or sympathise with, but, but a national identity that they identify with. And that's the key, that's one of the key points that, that, that we, we completely fail to understand and grasp and across the, the, the official structures in this country. And I think that requires more dialogue with the fans, people that go to the games. As I say, you know, I can't speak for colleagues at the table, I don't know, but I'm not only a researcher, but I know about football, I'm a football fan, and I think there's too many people that actually try and implement these rules and these laws and don't actually understand football culture. We're less than halfway through our line of questioning, so I can, I can ask both the questioners and the panel's responses to be as succinct as possible, please. Mr. Um, committees heard evidence from the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Society that repeal would leave a gap in the law. Do you agree? Um, I think the talk of a gap in the law rather begs the question frequently. I mean, for example, it's illegal in this country for a judge to sentence somebody to death if they're found guilty of murder. If I'm in favour of the death penalty, that's a gap in the law. If you're me and a squishy liberal person, you think it's a feature, not a bug in this context. So I think often when we talk about gaps in the law, we're begging the question. We're presupposing that the underlying behaviour should be criminalised. Um, if I try and set aside that suspicion of the question, I suppose in terms of Section 6 of the Act, it is very difficult to argue, whatever you think of its merits, uh, that there is a specific criminalisation in Scotland of incitement to religious hatred. That provision which does apply in England doesn't apply in Scotland, in part because it was resisted by Scottish MPs when Tony Blair's government uh, brought it in uh, several years ago. So I think it would create a gap in the law. It may well be possible that individuals could be prosecuted under other existing offences and, and that's one of the elements of this uh, scrutiny of this proposal to repeal the bill which I find a wee bit baffling on some level. Many critics of this bill, several of them on this panel, would argue that it's illiberal, that it interferes with free expression. But the policing around football and policing of singing songs around football is not new. It wasn't invented by this parliament in 2012. Several breach of the peace cases before this act came into force criminalised people singing because sometimes words read in their context are different than words in other contexts. If I go back to Glasgow this afternoon, enter a Celtic pub and start singing the famine song, then that is obviously my free expression on one level. But of course it could lead to public disorder and could be analysed under the rubric of breach of the peace. So I think, I find the idea that we can comprehensively, rather glibly say we shouldn't criminalise speech doesn't really relate to the law as we have had it before the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act and presents a rather exaggerated image of its illiberalism. There are plenty of examples from the annals of our courts where just words have ended up in court. Thank you. Ben. Um, Mr. Tickell, I wondered if you could elaborate on your specific concerns in relation to uh, the drafting of Section 1 and uh, your proposals for amendment. Yeah, so I think there are three particular problems with it. Firstly, we have the prohibited behaviours, the list of prohibited behaviours. There's five broad categories. There's expressing hatred against groups or individuals on the basis of protected characteristics. There's threatening behaviour, so behaviour that's threatening can be covered. Behaviour motivated by hatred, so that's behaviour which is not in itself an expression of hatefulness or is threatening, that's covered. And we have offensiveness. Now, personally, I don't think offensiveness is an appropriate threshold uh, for criminalisation. Uh, that's what's distinctive of this, of this act from the earlier breach of the peace provisions, which only criminalises behaviour which would cause the reasonable per person to suffer uh, fear and alarm in the context that it takes place. So I think you should knock out that section uh, of section one. Secondly, the definition of public order in the act is absolutely baffling. In the sense, uh, when uh, the Justice Minister, the Junior Justice Minister, came to the predecessor of this committee, uh, introducing this public order restriction, she represented it as a safeguard uh, for individuals who might be, find themselves accused of committing a criminal offence. But two things are excluded uh, from the Sheriff's deliberations about whether, in the context that, uh, that this criminal act took place, uh, the public order 
uh, public disorder would arise. So we can discount the fact that public disorder doesn't happen because of the police being there. So if the police are there uh, and public disorder doesn't result, then the accused can't claim any benefit from that. But secondly, if there's no one there to be incited, if we're in the kind of scenarios you've been talking about, where I'm not marching into a Celtic pub to sing the famine song, but I'm in a, a certain kind of fraternal Protestant brotherhood that sees this as a, a way of articulating a shared identity, in that kind of context, the sheriff is invited to invent fictional absent incitees. So often proponents of this legislation would say it's offensive in the context of football matches. Uh, and therefore it should be criminalised. That's often an argument you will hear. Whether or not you agree with that argument, the Act specifically instructs judges to completely ignore the actual context in which the behaviour takes place. I think that's perverse. We can fix that too by knocking out that section which invites the court to invent fictional incitees. The Scottish Government, even when they brought that in, recognised that that was a fairly indefensible uh, or not long-term defensible uh, section of this legislation because it gave ministers the power to knock it out using an order as opposed to primary legislation. So those are just a few of the examples of areas of problem and areas where there can be very straightforward fixes, leaving us only criminalising hateful behaviour, uh, which I know some members of the panel won't agree with, threatening behaviour in this context, which is likely to give rise to public disorder in the context that it is actually taking place in. I think that's a mainstream public order piece of legislation which is very much compatible with most UK approaches to dealing with this issue. Just very if, if you've got a contribution, uh, do you want to reply to that? Ju just very briefly before Dr Joseph Webster comes in, yeah. and I have another question for Mr Kerr. In terms of the context uh, point, there's been some argument from witnesses that football fans are unfairly targeted because of the, the context in which Section 1 is, is targeted. Mm -hmm. um, in your view, is that justified? And would, would a, an, an expansion of the, the context help mm -hmm. to alleviate some of that um, sense of, of, of being singled out? Mm -hmm. It was, I think, a point that your colleague Fulton and McGregor put to the fans against criminalisation. So their argument is this is discriminatory. It only targets football fans. One way to make it not discriminatory is to make it apply to everyone. And they were still against the legislation because of that offensiveness provision um, in there. I think when Lord Brackadale comes to give his proposals about hate crime, you're going to see not sectoral specific offences, but a comprehensive piece of legislation around this, like the common law of breach of the peace. I think the argument from discrimination against football fans is essentially a red herring, because if you would be unhappy about this extending to cricket matches and rugby matches, then your argument isn't principally about discrimination. It's about the act setting a too uh, low a hurdle for criminalisation. That would be my analysis. Mm -hmm. Briefly, Dr. Webster. Yeah, simply to come back on that to say that if we remove the pieces or the aspects of the legislation that is being suggested here, my sense is that uh, we lose everything that's distinctive about the Act and therefore we have no need of the Act uh, in itself. So uh, existing legislation, particularly breach of the peace, which we've already discussed, would seem to uh, stand. If you take away particularly the uh, element of offensiveness, which is the, the one thing that is genuinely unique about this act, then you take out the one thing that makes it what it is, and therefore, presumably, you no longer need the legislation in general. Ben, we really don't have very much Th time left. Th thank you, Convener. The, the, um, you spoke, Andrew Tekel, about the, the fact that, you, in, in your view, Brackendale will bring forward an extensive set of hate crime legislation, and, and, and this leads into what uh, Dr. Joseph Webster said there as well. So, is, is your view that repeal would take, uh, sorry, uh, revision would take place as part of that new piece of legislation and that it would almost be part of the consolidation and that would be a more advantageous way of I using what's good the in the idea. act there, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Don't thinking uh, carefully um, about and how it's... Okay. No, I don't think I would do that. And I think it's partly because of the critical voices on this panel and outside this parliament in relation to this bill. It's not uh, this act, sorry, the 20, 2012 act. It needs fixed, and it needs fixed now. And the power in section five give, is given to the Scottish ministers by order to fix all the things that I've described. They could lay that before you tomorrow if they wanted within the procedures of the parliament. I think that would be very sensible. It would deal with the substantive criticism of this legislation and then an amended bill could go forward and be taken account of in the context of the Brackadale report. After all, that's going to be a complicated area of law. I dare say you'll want to hold uh, scrutiny and hearings and a range of different folk will want to argue about what's in there. So that may be some way down the line in terms of that. But I think there's a strong argument to act now, not least because it would be good if the Scottish government showed some recognition that they got this one wrong. 
Um, and many, many people who are otherwise sympathetic to them uh, recognized that in several elements of this legislation, they rushed through it too hastily and made mistakes, as we all do when we rush, things, rush through these things much too hastily. That would can, be my analysis. Can I ask you about Dr. Uh, Webster's comment? If you, you remove all these things, the essence of the bill is gone anyway. So. Well, I suppose on, there's two different answers or two different ways you could look at that. Firstly, the message-related concerns, which a number of, of the folk that you've talked to would be, would be alleviated to some extent. There would still be a recognition of offending around football. Secondly, if you're a statistician, you might like the data in the sense it's useful to be able to identify specific categories of offending around football. Because after all, as I say, you don't have 20,000 people singing songs about up to your knees in Fenian blood at cricket matches. There is a particular set of problems around football in Scotland, and I think whatever you think about this legislation, one can't be blind to that fundamental fact. Okay, Morris. Yes, uh, referring to your written submission, um, can you elaborate on the way that you, you said that what are your key concerns with regard to Section 6 offences? In terms of how they do not provide yes. suitable provision for... Yes. I mean, my, 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 briefly, my point is very simple. My understanding is that... Um, Section uh, 5 uh, claims that it does not restrict the um, behaviours outlined in Section 7.1b, expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult and abuse. Mm -hmm. My sense is that the um, legislation is not sufficiently finely grained to allow particularly police officers on the ground to distinguish what is hatred mm -hmm. and what is antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult or abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and the inability to figure out which behaviour belongs in which category leads to policemen being put in the position of needing to interpret all sorts of areas of grey, which in conversation with police, my research suggests that they themselves really don't like being put in that interpretative mm -hmm. position. And also this fuels um, resentment and anger among grassroots fans who feel that uh, Expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, and abuse are indeed being criminalised, even though the legislation says that they are not. And just ask a quick question. Do you believe that's unfair then on the police to have to do that? To interpret these areas yes. of grey? The areas of grey. I think police interpret things all the time and generally do a very good job at doing so. The, the problem here is, is quite acute mm -hmm. insofar as there are a number of different categories mentioned in 7.1b which require far more interpretation than the police would normally be expected to apply on other pieces of legislation. So I'm not against the police interpreting things because I think they're professionals and they do a good job at interpretation mm -hmm. in general. Uh, but the level of interpretation that we're expecting here it goes far beyond that and as a result causes problematic situations within their own job and also how that job is perceived by those who themselves feel they're being targeted by the bill. Thank you. Can I ask if... Uh, uh, is it... Um, related to the other panel members and their views of Section 6? Yes, please. Repeal of that. Right. Can I just ask the other panel members, the three of you, uh, what's your views about repealing Section 6 and the problems you may see in that? I think I've already said to your colleague that there isn't direct provision in Scots mm -hmm. law that incitement to religious hatred should be a distinct offence. I mean, that's merely a statement of fact. Whether or not you think it should be is, again, an open uh, question in this context. I should stress, though, that this is not principally about football. So Section 6 is not about fans. If fans are particularly preoccupied by Section 6, then they're not reading the Act uh, closely. That's the threatening communications element of this legislation. So Section 6 extends much more widely. And if you abolish it uh, in this particular bill process, then I would be stunned if you're not reintroducing something quite similar in a few um, in a few months or a few years time down the line. I think that raises fundamental questions of principle. Why repeal it if it's something that you're very likely to want to back um, in future? No stream. Um, I mean, more generally on the communication side of things. I mean, you, you'll know. I, I think it's very problematic. Not not just, in, in that, you know, I don't think this law is in and of itself restricting freedom of speech. I think there are many, many, many laws, and it's become an accepted cultural framework. Um, and in terms of threatening communication, um, I, th I find a real problem with that. Um, in particular, that you can get arrested now for being threatening even though there's no evidence of any reality to the threat. So again, we are arresting people for saying stupid things, often when they are drunk, often then called hateful, even though there's, you know, 
you talk to these people, they're usually embarrassed, uh, feel they're stupid, and all the rest of it. So uh, I, I think there is a real problem with, again, the criminalization of words and the Im people putting people in prison um, for saying stupid things where there is absolutely no evidence at all that there is any intent to act upon uh, those stupid words. So these are essentially thought and word crimes that we're talking about. Thank you. Dr. Kerry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly agree with my two colleagues at the end um, in pretty much totality that if one was to revise the bill, then that may alleviate some of the, the fears that some of the minority groups have. Um, and in actual fact, and again, of, of, from the very beginning, I've, I've highlighted the following point is very positive about the original bill. The point being that it seeks to protect ethnic and national identities. But in reality, the way the bill has been policed, that's not what's been happening, unfortunately. The opposite has been the case. So would there be a gap? Potentially not. Lawyers are, are better and, and legal experts are better positioned to judge that than myself. But my gut would be that there might be a gap in the sense of protecting people's rights to express their national and ethnic identities. And that's the key. The implementation of that is the key because the current bill claims to do that. And I would argue it actually does the opposite in some of its some of the workings and implementations of the bill. Thank you. Um, maybe just to round off the committee's questions before I bring in James Kelly. Thank you, um, convener, and, and I, I will be, be, be brief. Um, currently, sectarianism is not defined in Scots law. Do the panel think it would be helpful, if it's possible to do it, to define it? Um, and, and would definition of it help in, in educating people to understand what it means and help to, if it needs to be eradicated, help to eradicate it? Yes, Dr. Dr. Webster. Webster. Very briefly, I think that's an excellent question. My sense is that the Scottish Government's uh, advisory group on sectarianism has already produced numerous reports, two of which uh, include pretty finely grained definitions of what sectarianism is. I think it would be helpful to define sectarianism. I think it's already been done, and it's been done by academics who the Scottish Parliament have themselves uh, asked to produce that type of definition. I'm thinking here of the work of Dr. Michael Rosie and others who have uh, been involved in the advisory group on sectarianism. That definition exists. It's a good definition, and I think it should be uh, taken seriously both uh, in the legislative process and also more widely in social and political debate. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Does anyone else want to yeah, comment? Um, well, I, I think if you look at research that's been done by Professor John Flint on this or recently uh, Tom Devine and, and other people. The question that they raise is not about the rise of sectarianism and the problem of sectarianism, but the obsession with it. And they make the observation that, uh, as far as most people can see or would argue, the problem of sectarianism, certainly in terms of uh, religion or its relation to uh, troubles in Northern Ireland is a fraction of what it was. In fact, Graham Spears wrote an article in 1997, that's 20 years ago, almost a generation, making this point about people in wine bars being obsessed with sectarianism. I think he may have been in too many wine bars in the last two decades, but never mind. But uh, Tom Devine, for example, said, for most of the last century when the disease of sectarianism was rampant and noxious, it was little discussed in public uh, or debated in public like an unpleasant smell at a middle class dinner party everyone knew it existed there but nobody wanted to talk about it today with the old monster in its death throes sectarianism has spawned a new growth sector a well-financed anti-sectarian industry a delicious irony indeed and i think time would and money would be better spent trying to work out why politicians talk about sectarianism so much at a time when, as uh, Tom Devine, who historically saw sectarianism as a problem, says that it is in its death throes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kelly, did you want to? Yes, I mean, uh, again, from the very early days of, of this bill and indeed before it, uh, as an academic and speaker in, in any kind of forum discussing these things, I've always said, let's define it, because uh, I don't think we have a clear definition in this country, although I take my colleague's point that the, the working group certainly provided what I thought was a fairly reasonable definition, and I think that needs to be a starting point, actually, if you are 
going to legislate for something that we generally call sectarian behaviour or sectarian identities. I think we do need to define it and agree on what it is, if indeed that's at all possible. And, you know, the police are very good at interpreting, as again, colleagues have said earlier, but I, I, don't, I think with this bill, we haven't given them a framework around which to, to even work from in terms of their interpretation. And it's led to all sorts of issues, and I have complete sympathy for, for, um, for the police and the courts, as well as the football fans that have been arrested. How important is education then to, to change behaviour? And, and it could be a, genera a generational thing, but how important is education? Oh, absolutely essential. I mean, my, my understanding is that we have a, a, a debate maybe within the panel about whether or not we want to go down the route of education, whether we want to aim for behaviour change. That's a separate debate. But if we do want to aim for behaviour change, the crucial way to bring about behaviour change is to um, engage in early years uh, education. Uh, you know, whether or not we um, value the aim of behaviour change is, is, is a different debate, as I say. But if we want to uh, encourage people to do certain things and not do others, we probably need to start telling them that when they're about age three or four, not when they're aged 18, 19, 20. By then, uh, in terms of behavioural science perspectives, it's simply too late. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Kelly. Okay, thank you, convener. Uh, I've got a question for each uh, panellist. Um, start with Dr. Wayton. You've uh, criticised the authoritarian uh, nature of the Act in your submission and also in your, uh, your evidence this morning. Uh, just wondered what your view is of the policing of the Act, the way it's been policed. Um, well, it's an interesting one because I was invited into Ibrox to look at the policing, because the police are aware of uh, my interest in this. And then I was invited into to Hamden to watch the uh, old firm semi-final, um, which was a bit more interesting, where 20,000 people did start singing uh, Billy Boys, although they'd been trying to hold on to their tongues uh, clearly for as long as possible, and then it just exploded. Um, didn't seem to create a public order issue, uh, is perhaps worth noting. Um, but as far as I can tell from the fans' responses, fans' responses in terms of uh, contact that I've received um, over the years, there is a sense of the um, escalation of surveillance, I suppose. I don't, I don't think it necessarily leads to arrest, but an escalation of surveillance and a sense that they are being policed permanently um, and have to watch their words, which some people would say uh, is, a, is a good thing. But I think that is a, a, um, a sentiment uh, amongst fans. There's also, uh, especially amongst Rangers fans, a growing resentment, I think, uh, uh, at least from a, a small piece of research I did, about what they see as Celtic being grasses. In other words, not, and this is not in relation to this bill particularly, um, but in general, but a sense that Celtic fans f tell the police. Uh, and I think there's a new tension, and potentially a tension will develop amongst other fans, where there is a feeling that different fan groups um, essentially tell tales on one another. Um, so it's not just about the policing directly, but about a sense that other fans are policing each other and a sense of resentment that's emerged around that. Okay, um, Dr Webster, you touched on this briefly in answer to one of the questions, but in terms of your research, uh, what does it tell you about the impact that the Act has had in the relationship between fans and police? I think it's a really important question. My sense is that it's done uh, two things. One, it has changed the way in which certain behaviours that are deemed offensive by the Act are enacted, in some cases in, in quite ingenious ways. We might not like the behaviours, but for instance, the idea of holding your hand in front of your mouth whilst you chant something well aware that you are being recorded by CCTV during that speech act indicates that we are seeing behaviour change, but we're not seeing a decrease in offensive behaviour. We're simply seeing a different way that that behaviour is being enacted. Um, my second uh, observation is to simply say that 
both sides of the sectarian divide, if you want to use Celtic and Rangers as the kind of typical case here, but my sense is that it's not typical at all, but let's put that aside for a moment. My sense is that what's happening is uh, both uh, opposing fan bases feel themselves to be uniquely victimized by the police. Rangers fans think that they are the ones being picked on, Celtic fans think they are the ones being picked on, and as a result, what we have is an environment where a um, fan base finds themselves not only at odds with each other, but at odds with the police. So in very simple terms, my sense is that this has not only made policing sectarianism more difficult because fans have got wise to how to circumvent the law, but also that it's led to a deterioration in the relationship between fan bases and also between fan bases and the police. Okay. Uh, Mr Tickle, just interested in your view in terms of how these cases are handled within the judicial system. Um, we've had submissions from a cu couple of lawyers who have said that normally, uh, as cases progress uh, in general in the system, at uh, low-level cases, there can be plea bargaining between lawyers and prosecutors. Cases may be withdrawn if there's not enough evidence by the prosecutors. But in, in, the, in relation to cases that have been brought forward for this Act, uh, nearly all the cases are brought to trial and the prosecutors, uh, so we're told by these lawyers, uh, don't have any capacity to negotiate or to plea bargain. I wonder if you've got a view on that. It certainly is likely to be the case, I think, given the high priority that the Crown Office, who got very involved in bringing this bill uh, to fruition, um, took towards the Football Act, that it was an important tool, as they presented it to the Justice Committee of the time, to deal with it. So they've clearly felt that they had to back it up all of the way. And as we've seen with the domestic abuse interventions, for example, from the police with the Crown Office, that if there is a policy coming out of Chambers Street, which is then enforced by procurator fiscals across the entire country, then their liberty to deal with cases in different ways will be um, restricted in that. I think that seems to be a clear, a clear example. Of course, one point that many critics of the bill would make is the conviction rates, despite all these cases going to court, are still not great. I mean, even the most recent figures still have uh, charges under the Football Act, the conviction rate being slightly lower than the general average of about 87%. Um, Maybe that's because cases are ending up in court, which might not otherwise have done so if prosecutors uh, had more discretion about, about particular cases before them. Okay, and final question to uh, Dr. Kelly. When the original legislation was brought forward in 2011, you made the, the reasonable point that the law needs to be explicit and unequivocal, and you uh, were anxious about the proposed legislation back then, and that it wasn't clear what was allowed and what, what is uh, mm -hmm. prohibited. Um, having seen the the Act passed and then implemented over five years. Uh, how do you feel those issues uh, have played out? I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've, they've come, they've, what, what was predicted by not just myself, but what was predicted by a number of people, a number of people who understand Scottish football and our football fans and researchers within football and possibly some of all of the above. Many of us suggested that this was likely to happen, that the police, and again, I come back to the police, that they, they were being asked to do an impossible task, an impossible job. And again, I agree with my colleagues. I think what's happened is we've had, rather than more tolerance and decency, if you like, even though, as I say, I don't think offence should, should be illegal, but, but even lack of offence, I think it's gone the opposite. There's been mistrust both between fans and indeed between the police and fans, there's been hyper, a certain feeling of hyper-surveillance um, and there's been a feeling that, possibly even in some cases wrong, wrongly, but wrongly feeling that some behaviours that actually aren't being targeted are being targeted. So there's, so there's just confusion pretty much around it. And it's, again, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of it comes back down to the very fact that this what was being policed wasn't well worded, wasn't purely defined, clear, clearly defined rather, and that might come back to some of the points. If, if we are seeking to criminalise um, sectarianism and tolerance against someone else's sectarian identity, then we need to be absolutely clear about defining that and defining that for the police, defining that for schools, defining that for discussions, and indeed if we're going to have education, discussions about it, not only, the, not only trying to 
train children to behave in a particular way, but to actually question why people are offended by these identities in the first place. I think that, that's crucial to any education programme on these issues, so I'm going a wee bit back to a point previously. Um, but I'm, I'm not surprised, I'm just in fi final summary of that, I'm absolutely not surprised what's happened has happened, and again, I think most commentators would agree that it's largely, not exclusively, but largely due to poor wording of the bill and a lack of agreement about what is offensive and what is a human right to express an identity. Can I, can I say one very brief point on this, though? I'm not sure that opponents of the bill who want to roll it back to breach of the peace are entirely logically coherent here. The definition of breach of the peace in Scots law is behaviour severe enough to alarm ordinary people and threaten serious disturbance in the community. That's from the case of Smith against Donnelly. That's not exactly a comprehensive set of detailed legal rules that the ordinary punter, uh, wherever they are in Scotland, can understand. So I suppose what I find slightly confusing about the position you've articulated as, as, as promoting this repeal bill is that you're criticising the offensive behaviour bill for being vague, but saying breach of the peace is fine, despite the fact that breach of the peace is notoriously vague and has been used to prosecute everything from playing marbles on a Sunday on the island of Lewis uh, to walking the streets of Aberdeen wearing women's clothing. So I think the, the critics of this legislation do have to uh, have some account of how the common law is somehow substantially better because uh, even though I think there's tremendous things wrong with this offensive behaviour at Football Act, the common law is notoriously vague, unclear, and doesn't specify to football fans what is and is not criminal. And that's what we'll obtain if this bill uh, passes and you repeal the Football Act. Last word, Dr. I really uh, want to come back on that just briefly. My sense is that what we have within the 2012 Act is a unique combination of problematic specificity and problematic vagueness. So we have the worst of both worlds, and what the breach of the peace offers, I think, is a, a not perfect but sufficiently general form of legislation to deal with these behaviours without getting caught up into reality or perception about this being targeted at football fans or indeed... Um, kind of including and weaving through the 2012 Act rather problematic, specific attention to the nature of offensive behaviour. So I'm not saying breach of the peace is perfect, but certainly my sense is that uh, what we have in the 2012 Act is a damaging combination of problematic specificity and problematic vagueness. That uh, concludes our lines of questioning. Can I thank all the uh, witnesses for attending and for your participation in the helping uh, the committee scrutinise this legislation. Agenda item six is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 9th November 2017. Um, following a verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments from, um, from members. I refer members to paper seven, which is the note by the clerk. Uh, Mary. Thank you, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 9th of November 2017 when it held an evidence session on the Police Service's budget planning for 2018-19 in preparation for the publication of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19 in December. The Subcommittee took evidence from the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Police Federation. The subcommittee heard about actions taken by Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to support financial planning and to develop its three-year and ten-year financial plans, and that the Auditor-General is to publish a Section 22 report again this year. The subcommittee heard that more is needed to be done to involve the unions and staff associations in discussions about budget priorities and future financial planning. It also heard about a reduction in custody capacity and the impact of the transfer of prisoners between custody centres. The next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 23rd of November when it will take evidence on the progress of the independent investigations into Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank Are you, any Convener. questions for Mary John Finney? Convener, I'll just make a brief point that, that uh, although it was a budget, there was very important information forthcoming on the issue of, of custodies. And uh, I was keen that we had a, a human rights assessment given to us by Police Scotland in respect of their current arrangements. I understand that has been asked for, but I do think that the, the, the subcommittee needs to look deeper into that issue. I think there are some significant matters we need to 
address. Yeah, there, there was certainly additional information yeah. requested and will be received on a, a number of yes. issues that were raised. Um, that being no more questions, thank you for that, Mary. Agenda item number seven invites members to delegate responsibility to me to arrange for the SPCB to pay on request witness expenses for the current civil litigation bill. Are we agreed? Thank you. Um, agenda item number eight, offensive, um, likewise invites members to delegate responsibility to me to arrange for the SPCB to pay on request witness expenses for the current offensive behaviour at football, etc. repeal bill. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Thank you for that. I now formally close the meeting. That concludes the 33rd meeting of, the 2000, of 2007. Our next meeting will be the 21st of November, when we'll be taking closing evidence from the Minister on, civil, on the Civil Litigation Bill and also considering the domestic abuse, abuse bill at Stage 2.